Tilly, wide left. Green comes to the bottom of your screen. Quick snap by Nia Lomax. Look, fires. He wants, dumps it off now to Doug Marsh to tight end. Good pump fake. Braceland was there. Lomax looked like he wanted to go wide to number 47. That was Cedric Mack. Now, Mack, quite a story there, used to play cornerback. That's right. Mack was a second-round draft choice last year for the Cardinals as a defensive back. And a la Roy Green, who also was a defensive back, where they moved the wide receiver, they did the same thing with Cedric Mack. They tried him at defensive back for a year, and now he's at a wide receiver, and he's doing a good job. You know, Roy Green, when he made the conversion from cornerback to wide receiver, he said the difference in the two positions, when you're a wide receiver, you can sleep the night before a game. When you're a defensive back or a cornerback, you cannot. Third and less than a yard, double tight end. Otis Anderson hurls for a first down for the Cardinals up near the 47-yard line. Leo Wisniewski, the nose tackle of the Colts, the man that made the hit. See the real straight created by the Cardinal offensive line. Very good, explosive, strong offensive line led by their all-pro veteran player, Terry Steed, eight-year veteran from Wisconsin. They pick up the first down. Line of scrimmage, the 47 of the St. Louis Cardinals. Tilly to the top of your screen. Roy Green back in there to the bottom. Otis Anderson. Blocks from Farrell. Anderson inside Colts territory down to the 45. About two yards shy of first down yardage. We talked about the six-year veteran out of Washington, Nesby Glasgow, the man that made the hit. Well, Jim, I tell you, if the Cardinals get their running game going along with their potent passing attack, they're going to be tough to stop this afternoon. O.J. Anderson is one of the top backs in the National Football League, and when he gets ahead of steam going, he's tough to bring down. I'd like to welcome some of our CBS television affiliates in Maryland. We understand that due to technical problems, you might have missed the top of the telecast. It's the Colts and the Cardinals both come in one and one. This is the opening salvo by St. Louis. They look at second and three. Play action from Lomax to Green, and he misses him again. Lomax and Green are just not on the same page so far in the opening period, but they will get on track. For the Colts fans back in Maryland, they had a couple of first downs and then punted the ball away. They did reach the 45 of St. Louis. Here we see the misfire from Lomax to Green. Well, Lomax is, seems to be always throwing uh, the receivers a little. He seems to be a little nervous in the early going. I'm sure he'll settle down as the game goes on. Had a great game a week ago as they simply buried Buffalo. Pat Tilly to the top of your screen. Roy Green comes down wide right. The lone running back is Otis Anderson. Double tight end. Doug Marsh and Greg LaFleur. Lomax on third and two. Colts jumped off sides. What were they drawn on? Fumble covered by Lomax at midfield. Vernon Maxwell forced the fumble. Let's check the call with Jerry Seaman. Colts, of course, on defense, very aggressive. They like to force the play, and they might have been a little over anxious. Offside against Indianapolis, and that will give the St. Louis Cardinals a big first down. That's a big penalty right there. You know, we talked about Nesby Glasgow being the senior citizen of the defensive unit for the Colts. Offside. First down. Nesby, number 25. He's in his eighth year, sixth year out of Washington. He talked about Coach Frank Cush because Nesby has been around for all three of Cush's years. First year under Coach Cush, he said it was my way or the highway. Second year, he said motivation through intimidation and humiliation. He said he's mellowed a bit. First and ten, Otis Anderson chopped down at the line of scrimmage. Might have gained a half yard by the other senior citizen. Six years out of Alabama, Barry Krause. All Barry Krause has done is play in 75 consecutive games for the Colts and tied for the lead in tackles in the club's last year. Otis Anderson snuck out with about six of the Cardinals. Didn't have the hotel food last night. They went down the street to a restaurant. <laughs> They're bringing three wide receivers in a second and long situation. Cedric Mack is the extra receiver. Slot to the right, Tilly outside, Green inside. Colts offside again. Lomax, free play. In trouble. Chopped down at the 49 of St. Louis by Greg Braceland, who came ripping through. Fifth year out of California, a free agent and a fine for the Colts. Now let's see, were the Colts drawn offside? Or did they just penetrate the uh, neutral zone? Vernon Maxwell. I think Vernon Maxwell, a little over anxious. He was blitzing on the play, along with Bracelin, and he just got a little over anxious. He's got to learn to watch that football, not listen to the snap count. Offside, number 56, defense, still second down. Jerry's got 
got a different haircut this year. It's a little shorter around the temple. Very. Well, the coach will have to give him. You're going to see him blitz a lot. They blitzed 70% of the time last week, which is an unbelievable high percentage to blitz. And when you're blitzing like that, it puts a lot of pressure on their defensive secondary. The coach have a young secondary, and the Cardinals passing attack is this strength. Second and four, flat to the left, green outside, to the inside. The usual means a pick. Otis Anderson, he picks his hole and bowls inside the 30 of the Colts down to the 28-yard line. Cliff Odom hanging on, but good blocking by Luis Sharp and Perry Steve over that left side. Let's talk about the blitzing Colts, the aggressiveness now, and how that changes the St. Louis philosophy and offense. Well, it, it hurts the running because the, the linebackers are playing upfield, and therefore if you get outside, you get around these guys, the linebackers, the blitzing linebackers, you're going to have a lot of real estate on the outside, and that's what happened here. Maxwell took it upfield too far, and Anderson cut it inside of him. Double tight end for the Cardinals, Marsh and LaFleur. Convoy over the right side for Otis Anderson, and he bowls his way down to the 22. James Burroughs met him head on, but not before Otis Anderson had rambled for seven. You like to be a defensive back and watch this fella come at you. I wouldn't like that. Let him go past me, then grab him from behind, because I would not take this man head on. He's got, he's got good speed to the outside, great size, and now he started against the Dallas Cowboys his rookie season, ran for 179 yards against Dallas in his first game. Five carries, 22 yards so far in this game for Otis Anderson. Dallas Cowboys know about Otis Anderson, believe me. Second down, three to go from the 22 of the Colts. Again, the floor and Marsh to the tight end. Roy Green, wide right. Pitchback, Otis Anderson fumbles the football, loose at the 25. Lomax says the Cardinals got it back. It's what Jerry Seaman says that counts. Cardinals dodged the bullet there. That's head coach Jim Hannafin in his fifth year. This is what the Colts want. They got to create the turnovers and, and make the Cardinals make the mistakes. And there's one, but they just didn't get on the football to capitalize on it. But it slows the Cardinals down a bit, creates a third down and six situation. Randy Clark, the man that fell on the football, if you look at down distance coming up here. We asked Jim Hannafin at the hotel last night, the Cardinals, who his biggest surprise is, the most pleasing player on offense so far. He said Randy Clark, moving to the guard position, stepping into the center. Third and six. From the shotgun. Penalty flag down, and maybe the Cardinals took too much time. Third and 11. A lot of penalties in the early going. This one against the Cardinals. And those are the type of penalties that you really hate to have because you work so hard in practice. Delay of game, number 15, offense, still third down. Jim, you work so hard in practice trying to avoid, uh, especially the delay penalties, and uh, right now it's going to create a third and 11 situation instead of a third and six for the Cardinals. Let's see if we can catch a pick formation over on the right side. Roy Green and Pat Tilly are lined up wide to the right. Lomax from the shotgun. They've got to get it down to the 19-yard line of the Colts. Colts are coming. Lomax looks to unload. Fires intercepted at the 11-yard line by James Burroughs. Burroughs with two interceptions last year, third year out of Michigan. See this situation, Roy Green, he's got the inside. It's man-to-man -man coverage because the Colts are blitzing. He's got it inside. He just kind of rounds the route off. He doesn't square it off, and, and Burroughs is right there on the coverage. Cedric Max, as you saw at the top of the screen, was wide open. Turnover against the Cardinals. Colts ball, and we come back. To the Hoosier Dome, a magnificent structure here in Indianapolis, the home of the Colts. And we've got a zip-to-zip -zip ball game early in the first quarter. First turnover of the football game. The Colts come away with it first and ten. They start from their own 16-yard line. Play action fake. Pagel's first pass. Wide open. The tight end. That is Dave Young. Free agent out of Purdue. First down for the Colts. 
Judge, and this is what happens when you get your running game going, get your running game off to a good start, and this is where the strength of the Colts passing attack lies in their play-action pass. Fake it to, to Curtis Dickey in the middle and just a little turn out to Dave Young, who was a number one draft choice for the New York Giants, but was cut by the Giants and picked up by the Colts. If you think it came as a surprise to the Cardinals, it probably did, because that's his first catch of the year. First and ten for the Colts from their own 34. Audible call by Pagel changes it. Running play, Curtis Dickey dies right side, breaks the tackle at the 35 and slithers up to the 37. Bubba Baker made the tackle. Let's talk about the audibleizing now. Do the Colts do it on a color scheme, on a number scheme? They do it on a number scheme. This way, it's hard for the defense to pick up the live, the live color, the contact color, or the contact number. They use their, the snap count to activate the audible situation. So if Pagel says 2-2 two, two, and it's the hot number, then he changes the, uh, the play call. That's right. He actually, he actually Let's see if we can pick it up. the 40 up near the 41 yard line in the grasp of Wayne Smith. He called two, so that was the dummy signal because he went on the first hut. Right. They stayed with the original play. Right. What he's reading and what he's keying on is the, is the defensive ends and the defensive tackles line up. If they line up to the outside, he wants to go away from that and either run the ball the other way or run it up the middle. If they line up inside, shading inside on the offensive Let's tackle and offensive guard, they want to run outside. How difficult is that for a player to adjust to? Now, you're up at the line of scrimmage. You've got a play call that you break the huddle. You've got that play in mind. And all of a sudden, you've got to listen for a number, a key, and then maybe change the play altogether. I think what the key is is concentration. You've got to concentrate. And it, it keeps everybody involved in the game. Third and two. Pagel, straight drop. Looks to unload safety valve. Partners are coming, and Pagel gets out of trouble. Dodges the bullet. He's off to the races. Slides for a first down at the St. Louis 37-yard line. Kurt Auerman made the tackle secure, but that was all Pagel, and what a job he did escaping Curtis Greer and Bubba Baker. Well, again, the Cardinals' pass rush is putting a lot of pressure on Pagel, but one thing Pagel can do very well is run with the football. He's very nifty back there, very nimble, and he was second in the NFL as far as quarterbacks rushing the football. And he gets downfield, gets a lot of real estate because the receivers are clearing everything out and being covered by linebackers and defensive backs, and he puts the slide in the second base. First down, Colts. When the Colts buried Buffalo a week ago, 37-7, Mike Pagel was sacked once, nor was he intercepted. It was a mistake free afternoon for the Colts. 37-yard line of St. Louis now as the Cardinals dig in on their defensive heel. Ray Butler comes out wide to the left side. Tracy Porter moves into a slot. Pitch back to Curtis Dickey. Almost chopped down, and Curtis Dickey out of bounds, down at the 35-yard line of St. Louis. E.J. Jr. chased him out of bounds, and there we have an early score in Minnesota. Battle of field goals, the Falcons and the Vikings. Likewise, fair to say it's Shea. It's at the Meadowlands. They moved across the river. Seattle, with that very tough defense, goes up early at Foxborough. He'll be chewing a lot of gum before this one's over. He expected a very physical game, he told us at the hotel last night. Well, both teams are physical. The Cardinals have always been a physical football team. Over the years, when, when Dallas played Cardinals, we always knew we were in a, a football game because these guys like to come out and hit. Butler left, quarter right. Second and nine. Colts. Benny Perrin and Lee Nelson hanging on, but the blocking on the right side by Donaldson, Stolt, and Wright. Watch the holes on the right side. Well, they've been going to Dickey, Dickey, Dickey. Now they go to McMillan on quick hit opener up the middle. And McMillan's a good, tough running back. He has good speed for his size. How about the defensive adjustment of the Cardinals now? It used to be the front four. They would play pass and then react to the run. They're maturing, though. That's right, they matured, and they, they think they can play the run as well as anybody. As we look at Frank Cush on the sideline, look at that intensity in his face. That might be an understatement. First and ten from the 26. Play action fake. Whistle, and it might be delay a game against the Colts. You know, you talk about the intensity on the face of Frank Cush. 
We had a chance to visit with him at the Colts complex yesterday after practice. He had a very rare hour and a half meeting with his coaches to go over the game plan, and he actually brought out the game plan and showed it to us. We saw how they call the plays. It is all very computerized. He's got his four or five favorite plays given every situation. Ball guard, number 76, offense, still first down. Frank said, he said, we know we're living with a sword. We may commit Harry Carey, but it's something we're going to have to do based on that. <laughs> But about that chart, they have a down and distance chart. And before the game and through their preparation, they know what plays they like in first and ten situations, second and six, second and three, whatever situation arises, they have plays designed for those situations. They call those plays in the order that they've got them in the game plan, and they track their success. In fact, the coaches are doing it in the booth to our right. First and 15, motion across by Tracy Porter. Great drop by Pago. Looks, fires, looks down for Dickey, and he cannot hang he caught it, but he was out of bounds at the 12. Bob Harris, the man who was there, the linebacker, but you just can't stay with Curtis Dickey out of the backfield. All right, Dickey's got that world-class speed. Like I said, it's unbelievable that he runs a 4-2-40, and that's, that's definitely world-class speed. And, and you see the pass protection, good pass protection that time from Pago, and he just kind of lays it over the linebacker, gets it over his head, and Dickey makes a great effort on the ball, just can't control it before he gets out of bounds. Kind of a fluttering pass by Pagel. Last week, we talked about his most productive day as a pro. He was 15 of 20, 215 yards, and three touchdowns. Mike looks in now at second and 15. Quick snap. Flood formation to the left side. Man open his quarter, and he misses it. Drop at the 10-yard line. Now, wait a minute. They, they think he caught the ball. Matt Booza. I'd like to see that one again. Well, he did. He missed the short receiver, and the long receiver was clearing out and just happened to come up with the football. Let's see if any green gets in there. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. It's Pagel again, good protection. He overthrows the short receiver on a, on a sideline route. But this Boozer was clearing out Wayne Smith, and he just comes back and makes a nice catch on the sideline. Got his first baseman's glove out on that one. Right, good catch. You wide receivers, you know how to covet that ball when it's down on the ground. That's huh? right, bring it in just outside the 10-yard line. Curtis Dickey. It's a foot race. Dickey wins. Touchdown, Indianapolis. When he gets the ball to Dickey on the outside, give him some running room. He takes it up. That draws the infield, in, the defense in, and he goes outside. And when it's a foot race like that, I guarantee you most of the time, Curtis Dickey's going to win. He's got good blocking on that side from Ron Salt and Jim Mills. Raul Allegra is standing next to Drew Pearson. He is out with a pulled hamstring. Dean Biasucci is in out of West Carolina to attempt the point after. The holder is Ron Spark. It's a 6 0 Colts advantage with 1.30 left to go in this first quarter. Second Indianapolis possession. Snap was high. Stark did a good job to whip it on down. And the Colts lead 7 0 after that 10 yard touchdown run by Curtis Dickey. Indianapolis 7, St. Louis nothing. Eastern Carolina, who actually had to borrow some clothes from Allegra just to make the trip to Houston. Understand that. His sport jacket came back a little worse for wear because Mr. Biasucci is 6'3 and about 190 pounds. Stump Mitchell. Back deep, the all-time leader in kickoff returns for the Cardinals with 108 in his career, passing Ali Matson and Terry Metcalf from the 35. Biasucci, low line drive kick. Mitchell fields at the 5, 10, 15, 20. Blockers set up 25. Hurls up close to the 30. Keeps on diving up to the 32. He got the last four or five kind of crawling along the ground. A 71-yard scoring drive by the Colts. They went nine plays. Dickey 10 yards in. The point after was good. And the Colts lead the Cardinals 7-0. My dander shampoo is good. Cardinals 7-0. St. Louis starts from their own 32-yard line. They've been unimpressive on offense. Roy Green and Neil Lomax have just not gotten together. Pat Tilly wide left. Roy Green wide right. Rick Farrell 31, the fullback. Quick out. Roy Green up to the 39-yard line. In the grasp of 
James Burroughs, who had the interception that set up that very impressive 71-yard scoring drive. Now, Drew Pearson. How come the Cardinals came in anticipating the run? They said, we're going to stop the run. Colts move it right down and score. Well, you can say you're going to stop it, but you actually got to go out there and do it. And the Colts have an excellent running attack. There's second in the National Football League in uh, rushing the football. They're 75 yards compared to the Cardinals, 25 yards rushing the football here in the first quarter. A three-to-one ratio advantage Colts. Second and short. Otis Anderson gets a block from Philly, turns the corner. Mismatch on the corner there, up to the 50-yard line. That's a first down. Eugene Daniel, but he was like a bowling pin going down with a bowling ball there. Daniel is just 179 pounds, and Otis Anderson tips the scales at 220. Well, the Cardinals are getting settled down now. They kind of knew that coming in here, the fans would be pumped up, the Colts would be pumped up, and they're going to let the depth settle and see where they are. They're trying to get in their offense, uh, get into, into their offensive game plan now. There is no dust in this artificial <laughs> surface, but you were down before the game, and each artificial stadium has its own characteristics. How might this differ from St. Louis? Well, this is good short turf. There's no elements here. It's not wet. It's dry, and they don't have to worry about slipping and sliding or anything like that. Matt Kelly wide left. Roy Green to the bottom of your screen. Lomax, quick release to Roy Green. Battle incomplete and almost intercepted by Burroughs. If Burroughs has another quarter of a step, he's off to the end zone. If Burroughs is doing a great job on Roy Green. He's not giving them much room. And Green is noted for his speed. He's very quick. His nickname is Jetstream. He don't get that name, a nickname like that from being slow. If Burroughs is keying a quarterback. He's watching Lomax's setup. He sees the short drop and just makes a break on the ball. Maybe later in the game, we're going to see Green run out and up on Burroughs to take advantage of Burroughs' aggressiveness. I think they might be setting that up. They could do Pitch back to Otis Anderson. Colts are coming and nothing doing. Look at the intensity on the part of the defense. Blaze Winters, the man that was doing his Mark Gastineau impersonation, the rookie out of Syracuse, and Greg Bracelin, fifth year from California, the first to get there. That rookie, by the way, leads the Colts in tackle. A quick first quarter here in Indianapolis. We're at the Hoosier Dome. The Colts have the only score, a 10-yard touchdown run by Curtis Dickey. So we'll start the second quarter as the Cardinals approach midfield, but they trail by a touchdown. CBS Sports coverage of the National Football League is sponsored by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. AT&T, the more you hear, the better we sound. And by Zenith Advanced System 3, the smart set. The quality goes in before the name goes off. Welcome back to the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. I'm Jim Kelly along with Drew Pearson, former Dallas Cowboy All-Pro wide receiver. And there's our score, the Colts leading the Cardinals 7-0. It's third and nine for the St. Louis Cardinals as they're approaching the 47-yard line of the Colts. Slot formation to the left side. Now they change it up. Roy Green goes outside. And Cedric Mack, former defensive back, along with Roy Green. That's Mack in motion across to the top of your screen. From the shotgun, Lomax, a long count. Colts are coming. Lomax looks. He wants Green. Fires. Did he catch it at the 32? Incomplete. Traps the ball. Eugene Daniel, the rookie from LSU, covering Roy Green one-on-one. -on -one. Eugene Daniel, by the way, a surprise package acquired in the eighth round of the draft. He's come on and given the uh, Colts some very steady play at cornerback. It was definitely a trap on that play, even though it was close, but the official was right on the play, and he made a good call. That's Larry Anderson back deep. We mentioned the former Pittsburgh Steeler, who has two Super Bowl rings. And back to do the punting, Carl Birdsong from Southwest Oklahoma State. Birdsong, last week he only punted one time and he put it out of bounds at the Buffalo Five. Bangs of beauty. It's a high, high kick. Fair catch called for by Anderson cleanly at the 12. So the Colts who lead 7-0 back there in be careful territory. Don't want any kind of a turnover. And the St. Louis defense, which has been reeling just a bit, would like to force some kind of a turnover. A 42-yard punt, no return. Colts ball from their own 12 when we come back. 
in this building. That's the philosophy of the Colts right now. You don't want to throw the ball down deep, but you do want to move it out and pick up a first down and not give the Cardinals good field position. That's right, Jim. They have 75 yards rushing the football in the first quarter. I mean, I guarantee you they're not going to throw the football down in this territory. They're going to make the Cardinals oh, stop their running game first. That's their game plan. They want to run the ball first. McMillan and Curtis Dickey in the backfield as Pagel comes in. Pitch back to Dickey. Sweeps to the right side. He's got a big hole. Big block by McMillan. Loose football down at the 12, but the whistle had blown. Charlie Baker, the first to get there, fifth year from New Mexico, along with Bob Harris. So you've got the two outside linebackers coming up to make the tackle. Doubleheader Sunday here on CBS. The 2-0 Giants against the 0-2 Redskins. We'll find out from that game which team is for real so far. And then the Eagles and the Cowboys. You had a few head knockers in that series. That's right. Uh, very physical football game. Any team in the NFC East that plays the Cowboys, give the Cowboys a hard time. It's going to be a good football game. Of course, both of those games affect the St. Louis Cardinals and their playoff possibilities. Cardinals want very desperately a win here this afternoon to go to 2-1. And off goes to McMillan. Cracks over the left side. Shy of the 20-yard line. And let's watch the second-year left tackle out of Northwestern, Chris Hinton. Hinton was, Hinton was all pro at the guard position as a rookie last year. They needed help at tackle, so they moved him to tackle. And he's got a good matchup today going against Curtis Greer. And that time he dominated Greer, gave McMillan some running room. This is a situation that the Colts like to be in. Third down and four. Let's see how the Cardinals' defensive front will play it now. The four down linemen and the three linebackers if they play the run. Spread out by Pagel. Fires over the middle, and this one is intercepted at the 46-yard line. That is Wayne Smith to the 35, to the 30. Looks for some blockers inside the 25. Hurls down to the 23-yard line. That's his second interception of the year. He had two all of last year, and the free agent from Purdue comes up with a big interception. Kind of a strange pass pattern. Now, when Pagel is chased out of the pocket, you expect him to go safety valve or pull it down and run, not throw across the field. Well, he's seen the inside receiver break open to the inside, but he just overthrows the receiver. Terrible on this play. You can see he wasn't even close, and Wayne Smith just laying back there and picks it off. And this is a big break for the St. Louis Cardinals. Good field position. Early about, in the second quarter. How about he underthrows the receiver? From the 24-yard line, the Cardinals start with great field position, but they trail 7-0. And the rookie, Blaze Winter, is really doing a gas now. He's up jumping around and trying to get the fans alive here at the Hoosier Dome. Double tight end alignment. Doug Marsh, regular four for the Cardinals. Flood formation right side with Green and Billy. Lomax will go to one of them. The sack is coming on. Lomax out of the pocket. He's got Otis Anderson. Otis Anderson to the 10. First down. St. Louis in the grasp of Mark Kiffin. Well, the Colts did what they said they were going to do. They blitzed on that play, and they put the pressure on Lomax, but Lomax not really noted for being a scrambler, but he is pretty nimble back there, and he couldn't avoid the rush. He comes out of it there and just finds Anderson, and great tackle here by Kiffin to stop the touchdown. That was number 55, Barry Krause, putting the pressure on Lomax. He simply ducked underneath. The line of scrimmage exactly where it was when Curtis Dickey went for 10 yards for the Colts, just outside the 10-yard line. 12, 20, and counting left before halftime. Roy Green, Pat Tilly ride to the left. Doug Marsh, the tight end. The lone running back is Otis Anderson. He's got the ball, and he's got a hole, and he's got a touchdown. Randy Clark, Terry Steve, and Luis Sharp. Nobody touched Otis Anderson from the 10, just like nobody touched Curtis Dickey from the 10. Uh, Louis Sharp, is uh, he's a top tackle. He's made all-rookie team in 1982, and they just caved the, the right side of the Colt defense in, and Anderson runs out, and he's wide open, untouched for six points. Out of the holes of Benny Perrin, Neil O'Donohue to attempt the point after. Anybody expected. Cardinals were anticipating stopping the run of the Colts. They have not. Cardinals expected to move the ball by the air, and they have not. The point after by Neil O'Donohue is good, and we've got a 7-7 standoff. The Colts scored first, but that big interception by Wayne Smith set up a 10-yard touchdown run by Otis Anderson. We are deadlocked 7-all. High end over end kick to Anderson up at the 11-yard line. Big hole. Hurls his body up to the 25, and the Colts start first and 10 from that point. A 
a 7-7 standoff, the Cardinals and the Colts. Baltimore's ball when we return. Right. Because obviously the wide receivers were going on a different count, didn't pick it up, they jumped offside. Well, you know, Jim, you can call these things in practice because you don't have the crowd. Ball start, number 18, offense. Call these things in practice because you don't have the crowd noise. But out here in the you know, Huger Dome, inside, it's pretty tough to pick up the signals. And the guys really have to listen, really have to be alert uh, to the quarterback snap count. Let's check in around the NFL today. It's been a day of field goals. Stenerud has added another. Two field goals in Green Bay. The Bears up over the Packers. More field goals. Cincinnati on top. Pagel on first and 15. Cardinals are coming. Looks like a lineman with a football. That's number 64. And he is an ineligible receiver. Here comes a late flag, but even I know that one. <laughs> that's a big thrill for Ben Hunt, though. He gets catch his first pass. I'm not sure that's a big thrill at all. <laughs> Now he knows what it's like to be a wide receiver. How'd you like to be a Cardinal uh, Cardinal defensive coordinator sitting up there? Wait a minute, who is 64? He's, we didn't see him in the film. Yeah. He's laughing. Look at Ben out there. He's, <laughs> laughing. He's having fun with it. <laughs> we don't see too many. Ineligible receiver, number 64. Caught the ball behind the line of scrimmage. It is merely launch of down. It'll be second down at the previous spot. You don't, you don't see too many 6'5", 280 receivers. He was cut by the Cowboys when you were there. <laughs> well, this guy's made the best catch of the day so far. And look at it. He knows what to do once he catches it. He runs up field and gets some yardage. <laughs> Next week, they'll be playing him at tight end. That's right. <laughs> Might not be too bad. Pretty good reaction there. So an illegal procedure against the Colts. Now an ineligible receiver. And all of a sudden, the Colts, from their own 20-yard line, are looking at second and 15. Coming out wide to the right, one of their eligible receivers, Matt Buza along with Tracy Porter, moves into the slot. Ray Butler, top of your screen. Randy McMillan, behind a Curtis Dickey block, explodes across the 25 and fights his way up to about the 27 and a half yard line in the grasp of Victor Heflin. Most teams, Jim, you see a second and 15 situation, they're gonna throw the football, but not the Indianapolis Colts. Again, that time, I believe they checked off at the line of scrimmage, seen the defense going one way and ran the ball the opposite direction. All right, if you're the Cardinals now and the Colts are looking at third and a long seven, this is a good blitz down. This is a good blitz down, but the Cardinals don't like the blitz. We talked to E.J. Jr. yesterday. They said they only blitz seven or eight times within a football game. Quick snap count. Pagel, straight drop, can run. But only if he got out of the grasp of those defensive front four. David Galloway, 65, and Groom, 78, the 10-year veteran out of Tennessee Tech, got through there. They are so quick. Well, this is the reason why they don't blitz that much, because they get good penetration from the defensive front. You see the stunning in the middle. Number 65, Dave Galloway coming around. Grooms picking up a lot of penetration. No room for Pagel to run. He has to eat the ball. Frank Cush over on the sideline. He strives for what he calls perfection through persistence. Stump Mitchell back deep, and you're looking at Ron Stark, the punter, who averages about 43 yards per kick. Cardinals could come out of this with good field position as Mitchell can break it for about 10. It's a high, oh, this is a beautiful kick by Stark. He sends Mitchell back to the 25 and back pedaling. Mitchell breaks it at the 30 to the 35 and out of bounds at the 37. Stump Mitchell, and that's why he is so effective on the specialty team. So the Cardinals do come out of it with pretty good field position, despite a tremendous kick by that man, Ron Stark. Cardinals and Colts deadlock 7 all. We've got 11-13 before halftime. It's here. Cardinals and Colts tied at 7 all here from the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. St. Louis starts first and 10 from their own 37. Pat Kelly comes out wide to the left side. Roy Green deployed to the top of the screen. The long running back is Otis Anderson. The tight end is Marsh. He's wide left. Play action fake by Lomax. Gives the pump fake. He's got Roy Green streaking down the field, and it's incomplete at the 17-yard line. James Burroughs, the rookie. They have tried to set Burroughs up several times with that little down and out to Roy Green. We talked about it. That time Green did the hook and go and turned it upfield. That's right. No, Lomax pumps the ball here. A little play action there to Otis Anderson. Pumps it to Tilly's side. Has Green going to the post. We kind of just lays it up there a little too much. Burroughs was beat on the play, but a great recovery by Burroughs. He's smooth back there. He's very fluid and 
God, he plays that position like he's been there for a long time. He's only a third-year veteran. He was uh, about three yards behind Roy Green and made up all that ground and more. Lomax now, 4 of 10, 35 yards. Cross blocking underneath for Otis Anderson. Hurls across the 40, down to the 43-yard line. Well, we said it was a day of field goals around the National Football League. Let's go to New York and find out who kicked one, Brent. Jim, this is the longest one of the day. Jan Stenerud just set a Minnesota Viking record, 54 yards. Against the Atlanta Falcons, Stenerud, of course, was turned loose by the Green Bay Packers, and as a result, Jimmy, the Vikes lead 6-3. Let's go back to Jim. Saw him last week against the Eagles, and he's like a fine wine. He just keeps getting better, Brent. I guess the has dried out after the Woodward yesterday. Third and four for the Cardinals. Lomax. Quick release. Marsh, the tight end. First down inside Colt territory. Bumped out of bounds at the 43 of Indianapolis. Greg Braceland, the man that chased him out of bounds. And while we're talking about Indianapolis, we'd like to send along our best wishes to the 1984 Indianapolis 500 winner, Rick Mears, who is watching today from Methodist Hospital here in Indianapolis after successful surgery on his right foot earlier in this week. Of course, you recall the crash during practice up in Montreal earlier this month. So, Rick, from all of us at CBS Sports, a very healthy and speedy recovery. First down for the Cardinals at the 43. What Lomax has done in his career, he was 5 of 11 now in the passing department. And that is number 31, Earl Farrell, third year out of East Tennessee State, behind the blocking of Joe Bostic and Randy Clark. Well, from the NFL and the Indy 500 to college football here on CBS Sports next Saturday. It's our national game, the Nebraska Cornhuskers, the UCLA Bruins. That should be a barn burner, as they say. Nebraska so explosive on offense, and the Bruins for that good aerial game as Terry O'Donoghue always has. Terry Donahue. Well, the wave has started here in Indianapolis. Second and seven, St. Louis. The wave started right there for the Colt defense. Barry Krause stayed in his lane. Showed his experience of 75 consecutive starts, and he met Otis Anderson head on. There is the wave. Here is the play. You don't think it's noisy now? It is, and it's the play like this will get the crowd even more fired up. See Barry Krause getting good penetration and just stopping Anderson before he can ever get started. Cardinals really have yet to get their aerial attack going. It, they just came out of sync. Yeah, they're fluttering right now, but their momentum has kind of shifted to their side, and they're, they got good field position, so things are happening for them. Shotgun formation, Tilly motion across. Watch the reaction of the Colts now as they backpedal. Pat Tilly incomplete at the five. Larry Anderson, seventh year out of Louisiana Tech. Tilly had a stride on him, but Lomax misfired. Lomax has been having his problems in the game. His timing the receivers seems to be off, overthrowing the receivers, underthrowing the receivers, and they got to talk on the sidelines and try to work something out. See Barry Kraus, he's pumped up. Back to do the punting, that is Carl Birdsong, and he will kick it to Larry Anderson, the man who didn't have to go very far after covering Pat Tilly. He just stayed right back there at about the five-yard line. The wave continues. The Colts' defense rose to it. We mentioned Birdsong's only punt last week against Houston was out of bounds at the five. High snap. He goes for the near coffin corner, angles a high, high kick, hits at the seven, takes a good St. Louis bounce, and is killed at about the seven-yard line. So good special teams coverage by the St. Louis Cardinals. And the Colts, again, after starting at their own 12 on the last series, will start from their own seven when we come back. 8.36 before halftime, we're tied 7-all. Patterns is America's day. 8.36 left before halftime. The Colts have picked up six first downs. The Cardinals eight. We are deadlocked at 7-all. And the Colts are back there in be careful territory once again. They don't want another turnover. The only turnover that they've surrendered so far, Wayne Smith's second interception of the season, led to a 10-yard touchdown run by Otis Anderson. St. Louis had great field position. Field position has not been in the Colts' favor so far this second quarter. And they need to get their running game back on track like it was in the first quarter to get themselves back in the good field position. 
Butler comes out wide to the right side. Porter, top of your screen. High pro set. McMillan, the fullback. Curtis Dickey, the tailback. And he's got a 10-yard touchdown run for the Colts. Motion across by Porter. Pagel to Curtis Dickey. Big hole right side. Steve Wright. Ray Donaldson doing the blocking. And again, that Colts offensive line, so crucial to their success. Let's take a look at that block. Well, that time they ran right over Ron Salt, their rookie guard, number one pick from Maryland. He creates a big hole in there for Curtis Dickey, and he just punches it, punches it up in there for a big game. You know, Frank Cush yesterday, he talked about the offensive line and how key it is to their success. He said, if our offensive line is not running and pass blocking, could we look like F troop running around out there? Second and two. First down for the Colts, Randy McMillan just bowled his way up across the 15-yard line near the 19 in the grasp of Mark Duda. As soon as you start keying on Dickey, they give it to McMillan, the quick, quick hitter up in the middle, picked up the first down. 55 years young, Frank Cush, the man on the left side of your screen, great career at Arizona State, then the Hamilton Tiger Cats before taking over the Baltimore Colts, going 0-8-1 in the strike season, 7-9 last year, and 1-1 one one as he brings his Colts to the Hoosier Dome. First and 10, Indianapolis. Play action by Pagel, look out, hit as he released the ball, and it's intercepted. Intercepted by Leonard Smith, touchdown St. Louis. Keep your eyes, we show you the replay on number 75, Curtis Greer, fifth year out of Michigan, used to be a high school quarterback. He's the man that gets the Pagel and forces the bad throw. Boom. Looks like Greer got the best of Chris Hinton that time, and Pagel gets smacked. You've never seen him coming. And Smith just takes it away from Dave Young, and he goes unmolested into the end zone. These are the type of breaks the Cardinals need, and the young, inexperienced team like the Indianapolis Colts will surrender these types of turnovers, and they just can't do it too much or give up too many. When their first loss against the New York Jets, they turned the ball over six times. Keep going to your right and follow number 45. That's Leonard Smith. That is Jim Hannafin. Leonard Smith in his second year out of McNeese State, the man that came up with that interception. Out of the hold of Benny Perrin, Neil O'Donohue will try for the point after. Two interceptions by the Colts, thrown by the Colts, both of them leading the Cardinal touchdown. When we come back, we'll talk about Leonard Smith, who came up with that interception and has given the Cardinals a touchdown lead over the Colts with 7-12 left in the first half. The one draft pick of the Cardinals a year ago hurt his ankle in the exhibition game at Wembley Stadium. Worked all summer with Tom Bettis, the defensive coordinator, looked at films, tried to make the adjustment, and he told us last night, in fact, his teammate told us, this, this guy is going to be around the football. What's his nickname? Sonny Shibo, and that's had something to do with karate. He takes karate lessons. He also has a nickname, The Devil. Also has a nickname, Wahoo. Well, his hero is Jack Tatum, so that tells you something. 14 to 7, Cardinals ahead for the first time. Bill Smith and the Colts are going backwards from the 14-yard line. First and 10, Indianapolis. Now, they have had two very costly turnovers. You take a look at next week's NFL schedule. These Cardinals will be in the Superdome. They go from dome to dome, taking on Bums boys down in New Orleans. 49ers visit Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. Ron Myers at home with the Patriots against the Washington Redskins. And, of course, the Redskins coming up next as part of our doubleheader. They're at home against the Giants. Giants are 2-0, and and the Redskins are 0-2. Packers have no points, and the Bears have two field goals. And the second half of our doubleheader next week, the Green Bay Packers will be at Drew's old stopping grounds, Texas Stadium, and the Chicago Bears take on Seattle. Boy, that'll be a great game. And I'll tell you why in just a second. First and ten, Colts. A little misdirection play to Randy McMillan goes for three tough yards. Curtis Greer, the man that forced Pagel to throw that interception on the last possession, the first to get there. Why is Chicago at Seattle such a great game? How do you like to see Walter Payton and Franco Harris on the same football field? It'd be awesome. Two, two running backs pursuing Jim Brown's all-time rushing record in the National Football League, and the only question is which one is going to get there first. The Colts need a big play. They need to get some more momentum on the side, get this crowd back into the game. Need a first down, second and six. Line of scrimmage, the Colts, 19 yard line. Play action fake. Pagel, look out. Fire. 
fires over the middle. He's got the tight end again. Dave Young, first down for the Colts. And that was a nice pass by Pagel. He knew he had to zip that ball in there. Because Young was open, but the man covering was, you know, right there with him. But Pagel zipped that ball in there. Play action again. Cardinals have to respect the Colt running game. And Pagel sets up strong that time and just zips it in there to Dave Young for the first down. How about the development of young Mike Pagel? Zeke Barkowski, former Green Bay Packers quarterback, has been working with Pagel. Well, Pagel, you know, he had a good uh, end of the season last year. And again, things kind of fell off for him in the preseason. But he's picking up the pace now. And he's going to be a top quarterback in this league before he's through. Cardinals fake the blitz. First and ten, Indianapolis from their own 37 after that 19-yard completion. Dickey unloads, wide open to Tracy Porter. Touchdown for the Colts. It was set up beautifully, and Lionel Washington, the cornerback, came up to play run when he saw Curtis Dickey get the ball. Tracy Porter wide open at 63 unmolested yards. Well, you know, Curtis Dickey made a great pass on this play, but what makes this play go is what the receiver does. He has to act like he's blocking the cornerback, and then when that cornerback makes the move, slip by him. And Tracy Porter almost dropped it there. He juggled it, but he had enough to hold on to it to take it in for 63 yards and a touchdown. What goes through your mind is you're a receiver. You're out there. You're all alone. There's nobody but you and the tuba player, and that ball's just kind of floating. You can't wait for it to get there. Well, it seems like eternity before that ball gets to you, and you just kind of think about, put everything out of your mind, just think about catching that football. And those are the toughest catches when you're wide open like that. When you're in the crowd, you might not catch it. Nobody, you know, expects you to catch it. But when you're wide open like that, they expect you to catch it, and you better catch it. Did you ever drop one like that? No, never, not me. <laughs> that looked like one you might have thrown when you played quarterback right. in high school. Well, there that it wobbly is. duck. You see Dickey tucks that ball under his arm, and he throws it. He doesn't set up. He just flutters it out there. And that's why Porter had a little trouble kept holding on, and he almost dropped that thing. This NFL Most Valuable Player segment is brought to you by IBM. Once a baby-faced free agent, St. Louis quarterback Jim Hart struggled through an up-and-down career that rose skyward in 1974. Hart thrives in a hothouse offense that produces not garden-variety victories, but a string of last-second miracles. The Cardiac Cardinals win a division title, and Jim Hart commands center stage as the NFL's Player of the Year. This is Mitchell is back deep, number 30 for the St. Louis Cardinals. That is one of the upbacks, number 57. And meanwhile, Dean Wyatuki will spot it from the 35. He gets away a beautiful kick. It backs Mitchell one yard in the end zone. You don't think that 63-yard touchdown from Curtis Dickey to Tracy Porter brought this crowd back to life? Well, they needed a big play like that to get themselves back in the game, also get the crowd back into the game. And, you know, one thing kind of leads to another, and they just got good kickoff coverage there to stop the, Col uh, the Cardinals on the 20-yard line. Well, we saw some good boxing yesterday on CBS Sports Saturday as Thomas Hitman Hearns returned. Jerry Cooney returns against Philip Brown next Saturday. A 10-round scheduled Bart out from Anchorage, Alaska. Cooney, of course, long, long layoff after that heavyweight championship bout with Larry Holmes, the pride of Eastern Pennsylvania. First and ten for the Cardinals, still reeling a little bit from that flea flicker. Otis Anderson. This crowd can help the Colts. That's right. right. I was getting ready to say, Jim, momentum has switched back to the Colts, and this crowd, when they get that momentum going, the crowd jumps right behind them, and this gives them that much more inspiration. They're playing with a lot of intensity right now, a lot of aggressiveness. They're making things happen instead of waiting for them to happen. That's what a young football team has to do. That's right. They have to play with that intensity and concentration on every play. Pat Tilly comes out wide to the left side. Roy Green, top of your screen. Second and 11 for Neil Lomax. Little delay to Farrell. Not much doing. Cracks over the 20 in the vicinity of the 22 in the grasp of Barry Krause and Nesby Glasgow. What the Colts defense is doing now, they're, they're doing, making St. Louis do things that they don't like to do is just run that ball, run that ball. It's two downs. Now they got a, a third and eight situation. Now it's a, definitely a passing down. And, 
the Colts bring in their extra back in nickel defense to try to stop the Cardinals in a third and eight situation. That is Tate Randall, number 35, third year defensive back out of Texas Tech. Third down conversion, the St. Louis Cardinals are two out of five. You saw the down and distance, third and eight from the 22 of St. Louis. Lomax was not looking, somehow pulled the snap down, unloads near the 30-yard line and dives to the 30. Willard Harrell incomplete right in front of the Cardinal bench. Juggling the football. Watch Lomax. Watch his head. He wasn't looking at the snap. Well, Lomax was looking at the defense, maybe possibly getting ready to call an audible, but the snap was already snapped, and he made a good catch on the play. But there, Harrell has the ball, but good play by Braceland to strip the ball from Harrell, create a fourth down situation. It would have been very close to a first down. Back deep to do the punting. Carl Birdsong, and what he's done this afternoon, Larry Anderson, awaits back at the Colts' 37-yard line. So Indianapolis could come out of this with good field position. It's still about 335 left to go. Birdsong, oh, he bangs a beauty. It is a high, spiraling kick. It backs Anderson up to the 28. And down at the 33. Loose football, and it looks like the Cardinals have it. St. Louis, first and 10 at the Colts' 30-yard line. Victor Heflin, the man that forced the fumble. Let's see who gets up off the bottom of the pile, but there are lots of white jerseys with red numerals. A 50-yard kick, and it had that man, Larry Anderson, backpedaling. Now watch Heflin come in, and he forces it right there. Well, Anderson's going down. He tried to switch the ball in his other hand, and, and in doing so, he lost control of it. And this is a big turnover for, for the ball, uh, excuse me, Indianapolis Colts. Nico Noga, the man who was on that football, You know, when uh, he was drafted, he was a fifth-round draft choice, and when they called him, he said, where's St. Louis? <laughs> I guarantee you he knows where, where it is right now. He's got good speed. He runs a 4 6 40. That's excellent speed for a linebacker. You can't miss it. It's got a big arch by the river. That's right. First and 10 for the Cardinals. Pat Tilly comes on wide left. Roy Green, top of your screen. That's Marsh moving into the slot. The other tight end in there is Greg LaFleur. Lone running back, gets the ball, play action fake is Anderson. Lomax in trouble, unloads, looks. It is intercepted by Burroughs again. His second interception of the game. Lomax threw that ball in the crowd. O.J. Anderson did not want to go get it. He was looking to see who was around him. In the meantime, Burroughs was making his second interception. Lomax has been putting that ball up in some strange areas. This does not like, look like the Neil Lomax of last week when the Cardinals were so sharp in their passing game. He's having a lot of problems here in the first half. And you could see the frustration on Jim Hannafin's face. He's wondering what in the world is going on. So you won't see a receiver in the vicinity. A good play action pass. He's got all the time in the world. And a little pressure there from 96 Blaze Winter. But watch Anderson look up field. He doesn't, enough, he doesn't want to catch that football. Too many blue jerseys in the area. That's Curtis Dickey, who bowls to about the 15-yard line. Meanwhile, we've got some field goals going on and some scoring, I guess, from Green Bay. Brent, have you dried off from the Woodward yesterday? Then we've got an update. The Green Bay Packers last week, James Lofton, was shut out by the Raiders. Well, here he is going 40 yards through the air against the Chicago Bears. That set up a touchdown. And the Packers now lead the Bears 7-6. Let's go back. All right, Brett, thank you very much. Here's our score at the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. The Cardinals and the Colts deadlocked at 14. As we seesaw back and forth now, a fumble recovery by the Cardinals. James Burroughs comes up with his second interception. It's an injured Cardinal player down on the field, and we'll get that number for you in just a second. In the meantime, this telecast presented by authority of the National Football League. It's intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the express written consent of the Indianapolis Colts and the National Football League is prohibited. It's David Galloway, number 65, third year out of Florida. Second round draft pick at the left tackle spot for the Cardinals, who is the injured man. And of course, we've got a 14-all standoff here coming up. Doubleheader Sunday here on CBS Sports. The Giants and the Redskins, two teams going in opposite directions. The Giants are 2-0, the Redskins are 0-2. And, and then it will be the Philadelphia Eagles taking on the Dallas Cowboys. The Jets have 
taking the lead. And East Rutherford. Green Bay, we had that update from Brent Musburger just a couple of seconds ago. So the Packers on top over the Bears. Atlanta now has gotten the equalizer after that record field goal by Jan Stenerud. And look what Seattle is doing in New England. Second half of our doubleheader Sunday next week, the Bears and the Seahawks. Franco Harris and Walter Payton on the same field. And Kansas City showing there for real. What a job. What a job Todd Blackledge has done filling in for the injured Bill Kenny at quarterback. And you saw that 10-0 lead over the Raiders. Second down, nine to go. Spread out by Pagel. Looks, fires to Butler. Great catch, and he drops the ball. The two officials were a bit indecisive, Drew Pearson. Now, the one official looked at the other and said, is it a catch or not? Neither one would make the call. Well, it's a tough call. The question remains whether Butler, who made a great catch on the play, if he took a couple steps with the football. My estimation, he took a couple steps, and it should have been a fumble. But this is a great catch and a nice throw by Pagel. He puts it away and loses it on the way down. And now watch the official. He's looking at the other one and says, you call it. You call it. I don't want, I don't want any pressure here. You, you take it. They call it incomplete pass. I guess that was the safest call. But a good effort by Ray Butler, who's really improved this year as a receiver. Caught two touchdown passes last, year, uh, last week for the Colts. Pagel now three out of eight, 56 yards, two interceptions. Third and nine. Slot formation to the right side, Butler wide left. Cardinals take the blitz. Nickel back in there now. Benny Perrin. Big hole. Dickey. Loose football. Cardinals dive for it at the 29-yard line. The Colts dive for it. And the Colts get out of it with a first down. Ben Hunt, the man that fell on the loose football. He's having quite a game. He's caught a pass. He's fallen out of fumble. Big day for Ben Hunt. Man in the right place at the right time. How many times you see third and eight situation, third and nine situation, the team runs a draw play and picks up the first down. Watch the reaction of Hutt now. He'll come in from the right side of your screen. Well, this is what happens, Jim, when you keep hustling. Things like this happen. You, get in the, you end up in the right place at the right time. We're going to make him a running back and a tight end the way he's playing today. First and ten Colts. You don't think that was a big play. They keep the football. They pick up a first down. Otherwise, the Cardinals would have gotten it back with 2.20 to play. We approach halftime, and we are tied 14 all. Tracy Porter wide left. Butler comes to the near side. great example of the defender Bob Harris not knowing that the ball was coming he is reacting to the receiver and he just batted it down with his back turned to the ball right, when, he, when he sees the receiver hands go up to make the catch that's when he becomes a defensive back and tries to knock the ball away time left in the first half Cardinals and Colts Tedlock at 14 all there's nothing like the wonderment of a boy catching a football this message furnished by the National Football League Jim Kelly and Drew Pearson, welcome back to the Hoosier Dome. We've got a good one going in Indianapolis, the Colts and Cardinals, and it's Indianapolis's ball, second and ten, and the concern written all over the face of that man, Jim Hannafin, in his fifth year as the head coach, great offensive line coach. Those offensive linemen, they're really Hannafin's kind of people. He, every once in a while, we'll down a brew or two with him. He drinks with him, he cries with him, and he shares their success. Second and ten, Pagel, slot to the right. to George Wamsley. Looks for a block and gets it. Turns the corner up near the 35. Penalty flag is thrown, and I believe you'll have a clip called against the Colts. George Wamsley, a rookie out of Mississippi State. If that name sounds familiar, his brother Otis plays for the Redskins. The illegal use of hands against the Colts will back them up. Coming up at halftime, scores and highlights with Brent and Irv back in the studio in New York. And Irv, I'm told, will have a giant surprise. You don't suppose that's the New York Giants, do you? Probably is. They've got the big Illegal surprise. block, number 80, offense, still second down, Giants, third down. Giants are 2-0, oh, and the last time they were 2-0, oh, I think it was when, 1968? 68, that's what the surprise is all about, I guess. Where were you in 68? 68, I was in uh, New Jersey, matter of fact, in high school. 
playing quarterback. The good old day. Speaking of quarterbacks, the Colts quarterback, you know who his idol was as he was growing up? He was Fran Tarkenton. He said he admired the fact that Fran did it more on raw talent. But Tarkenton wasn't the biggest or the strongest. Second, 17. Up near the 32-yard line in the grass to Alvin Moore. He threw that pass like a Fran Tarkenton. He got it out there to Moore. Good sideline route. Allows Moore to get, catch the ball and get out of bounds and stop the clock. See, Pego, he sets up strong this time. When he sets up strong, gets his feet set, he's a tough quarterback. He's got a good arm. He can fire it in there. Good pass to, to Alvin Moore. He gets out of bounds for the first, uh, excuse me, for third and eighth situation. Of course, Pagel played for Frank Cush at Arizona State, and Mike Pagel's father-in-law also played for Cush at Arizona State. Good baseball player, too, Mike Pagel. Third and eight. Cardinals are coming. Bubba Baker cracks on through, and Pagel dodges a bullet and gets out of it. Pagel, he's got Butler. First down for the Colts. See, he did his best friend Tarkington impersonation there, didn't he? Well, you know, he gets pressure here, but a lot of times, you know, to avoid the quarterback sacks, a lot of quarterbacks will get sacked in this situation, but Pagel's able to run and get out of there, avoid the rush, get outside and look upfield. Good pass on the run to Butler. Butler steps out of bounds to stop the clock. We've got a first and 10 on the 47. Quarterbacks love you wide receivers that come back to the ball and help out when you're in trouble, too. That's right. That's what you're supposed to do. It's easy for the quarterback to, and then he's on the move like that, to throw shorter passes than to throw the long pass. So you to come back to the football, come back to the quarterback. From their own 47, the Colts have something going. Butler wide left, slot to the left side with Porter. Looks for Butler. Down at about the 35-yard line. Incidental contact. Lionel Washington was there. Washington, he's got to be a little jittery right now after that 63-yarder from Curtis Dickey to Tracy Porter. That's right. Well, that was a play-action pass, so you kind of got to give him, uh, give somebody else credit for that. Give the Colts credit, not a detriment or a negative against Lionel Washington on that play. But that, that time, the Cardinals were in the blitz situation. That's why Washington was man-to-man -man on Ray Butler, and he did a good job covering him. Butler left, Porter wide right, along with number 85, Matt Boozer. Pagel bends in, second and five. A little delay, Curtis Dickey hammered down just about at midfield, a short pickup of three, brings up third and seven. E.J. Jr. and Mark Duda, first to get there for the Cardinals. Trying to surprise the Cardinals defense that time with a quick hitting play up the middle, but the Cardinals are ready for it. They call a timeout. They have two timeouts left here with a minute 29 seconds. They got to get that ball at least 20 to 25 yards downfield to even be even consider field goal range. How about number 54, EJ Jr. Last night in the hotel, he was walking around wearing his T-shirt. It said the Enforcer on it. EJ Jr. in his fourth year out of Alabama, 6'3", 235. And he credits Floyd Peters with really helping to mold and shape the St. Louis defense. He said things have been different since 82 when Peters came over. And uh, their goal now is what? To be, the, I guess, the best in the NFL. And they can be. They're a very physical defensive football team. Even in the years when the Cardinals were having a lot of trouble uh, with their teams, not winning the games and not making the playoffs, they always have been a physical, aggressive defensive football team. And now they have good athletes in the skill position, uh, led by that man, E.J. Jr. And, you know, Jr. had his problems off the field, but he's got all that corrected now, and he's just concentrating on, on football. He's studying to be a doctor. And he credits uh, Floyd Peters, his coach now says, Floyd reminds him an awful lot of his college coach, Ken Donahue at Alabama, and even his high school coach, Phil Grammer. Colts are four out of seven third down conversions. They need seven here to keep the drive going. Baker. Cardinals come with a stunt. Baker's got him back at the 40-yard line. Bubba Baker. That time the Cardinals stun it in there with their front four and also brought E.J. Jr., their middle linebacker, and that was just too much pressure for the for the Colts to handle. You see Jr. coming there on the blitz, and Bubba Baker all over him. Big Al Bubba Baker. Yeah, he's quite a speaker. 6'6", 270, very personable. He talked about team meetings. He said, I heard the average attention span of a person is 22 minutes. I was shortchanged by 21. <laughs> Well, he's some football player, and he's happy in St. Louis, and he had 13 and a half sacks last year, and he's picking off right where he left off last season. 
We've got 1.25 left to go before halftime, and at halftime, Brent Musburger and Irv Cross with scores and highlights from around the NFL today. And of course, it's doubleheader Sunday here on CBS, so many of you will see the 2-0 New York Giants taking on the 0-2 Washington Redskins from RFK Stadium, or you'll see Drew Pearson's old team, the Dallas Cowboys, playing host to the Philadelphia Eagles, and there's some finger-pointing going on down Dallas way. That's right, having some problems down there. And Problems with the coaching staff, problems with the players criticizing the coaching staff, and that's something that's never happened in the 11 years I've played with Dallas. Never criticized the coaching staff, at least publicly. Sure never got in the papers, but it did, and Landry said something about it this week. Stark, averaging 49 yards per kick. Stump Mitchell, field to the 20, gets a block to the 25, across the 30, and down at the 33-yard line before he's gang tackled. And one of the Colts in there was George Wansley, brother of Otis for the Washington Redskins. You see time left, first half. If you're the Cardinals down, your passing game has been a little better than lousy. Do you put it up and risk a turnover, or you go out content 14 all? Sure, they got a minute and 14 seconds left in this half. They got good field position here, so I think they're going to put the ball up. They need to get some momentum going. If they can move the ball well in this two-minute situation, get themselves in field goal position at the least, then it's got to give their offense a shot in the arm, a little momentum going into the locker room at halftime. Line of scrimmage to 33. Neil Lomax. 14 for 48 yards and two interceptions. Uncharacteristic stats for Neil Homer, especially after that great game last week as they buried Buffalo. Green and Philly on the same side. That usually means a pick. Lomax. Colts are coming. Otis Anderson. Incomplete. Intercepted out of bounds by Nancy Glasgow. He had the ball, but he juggled it as he crossed the end line right in front of that Baltimore bench. Glasgow didn't come up with the play, but he was right there on Johnny on the spot. He made a, a heck of a play. They're trying to get that ball to Otis Anderson on the corner round. Glasgow playing free safety, just read the play all the way. And that's why he's a defensive back, not a wide receiver. Right in his hands. Talked to Nesby on Friday after the Colts practice, and he said, being competitive is the start for this young team. He said, we don't win a game as much as the other team will lose it. And he laughed. He said, we wouldn't mind if our opponents lost the next 14 minutes. Flood formation to the right side for Lomax, second and ten. Floating pocket, right side. Lomax looks, unloads to Anderson, who drops it at the 40-yard line. In fairness to Neil Lomax, now, some of the balls have been badly thrown. There have been some drop like that one there. And you made a very good point about Roy Green and the routes that he was running. Too deep and helping to bring the defender up toward the ball. That's right. When you run that sideline route or in route, you got to make those cuts and breaks sharp. If you don't, you're going to round that thing off. It's going to throw your timing off between the quarterback and the receiver. You see Roy Green at the top of the screen. He's in man-to-man -man coverage. He just runs his out and up. A good move by Roy Green. He should have been the man the ball was thrown to, but they threw underneath in the coverage to Otis Anderson, and he couldn't hold on. Third and 10, 101 left, and the Colts will get the ball back. Flood formation to the left side. Green is on the right, Philly is on the left. Colts are coming. Otis Anderson drops it, and that would have been a St. Louis first down. Nesby Glasgow was right there, Johnny on the spot. Or well, Nesby on the spot. Excuse me, Jim. The last two passes have been over the month on the money to Otis Anderson, but he just couldn't hold on. And you gotta give the coach defense credit for stopping St. Louis in this situation. The fans here in Indianapolis are giving them credit. Lots of noise in the Hoosier Dome. Larry Anderson, who fumbled, is back on the Baltimore, or on the, excuse me, now you got me doing it, on the Indianapolis bench. That's one. Eugene, that's right, one apiece. Eugene Daniel is out there now. Number 38 for the Colts. Birdsong back to do the punting. He averages about 42 yards per kick. His longest so far this year, 52 yards. Low snap, fields it, gets it away, and goes down. It is okay because of the bobble snap. Daniel lets it bounce, and it takes a St. Louis bounce down to the 15-yard line. Let's take a look at our NFL schedule next week here on CBS. These Cardinals in New Orleans, the 49ers at Philadelphia, Washington entertained by New England, and the Rams will be at Cincinnati. Some scores at halftime, and at halftime, Brett Musburger and Irv Cross will have scores and highlights for us. It has been a day of field goals, as Brent was reporting on a little bit earlier. Now there's a penalty flag down at the 45-yard line. 
Big break for the Colts. Infraction against the Cardinals. The ball is back at the 15-yard line. Do you risk a turnover or you just run out the clock at this point? Well, the, I guess they're going to play the ball right there where it was. And Eugene Daniel is a rookie back there returning punts. He made a mistake on that play. He should have fielded the ball in the air. Instead, he let it bounce. Instead of having the ball in the 35, they had a foul. Number 46, kicking team, first down. I wonder if Bubba Baker ever stops talking. He's down there. He's jawing laughing with Ray Butler over across the line of scrimmage. The two of them having a good laugh while Jerry Seaman straightens things out. Well, you know, when I was playing against the Cardinals and Bubba Baker, he's, uh, he's actually very vocal during the whole game. He's laughing, he's, he's clowning, but when he gets down to, to, to nut and bolt time, he gets very serious. But he's got a great personality. He's a lot of fun to be around. And he'll be teeing off looking for a pass from Pago. Mike is 5 of 12, 80 yards, and he's thrown two interceptions. Six defensive backs in there now for the St. Louis Cardinals, anticipating pass. They'll get it. Pagel fires. Porter's got it. First down, Colts at midfield. Nice catch by Tracy Porter. Porter averages about 15 yards per catch. He's got a 63-yard scoring reception thrown by Curtis Dickey. This one goes for 20. Right, Porter's on the inside there. The outside receiver Booz is just clearing out. Porter takes it inside, fakes inside, and breaks it out on a little corner route to make the heck of a catch over his shoulder. Nice pass by Pagel. How about, miss, yard game. How about missed coverage? EJ Jr. should not, you should not have a linebacker isolated on a wide receiver. Well, not in this situation, not in the two minutes in the passing situation. Quick snap by Pagel. Look out. Gets out of it again. Pagel stripped and chopped down at the 46 yard line. Quickly, the Colts call timeout. Brooms, the first to get there. Boy, you see just how quickly the Cardinals' front four can react. And they do it all with their front four. They don't blitz that much in their front four. They do a lot of stunning. I asked Bubba Baker yesterday in the meeting, are they going to stun a lot? And he avoided me, so that let me know that they, they were going to stun a lot. And when we played the Cardinals, that's what they did. That's how they got pressure on the quarterback. And there's Curtis Greer bringing them down, getting another sack. They call themselves the sack attack. There is young Mike Pagel. We mentioned that he just turned 24 last week, but he's been a starter for Frank Cush and the Colts for three straight seasons. When we talked to Coach Cush yesterday at the Colts Complex, he said the key to Mike's career and to his success right now is how much he can mature this year. He started coming on, as you pointed out, Drew, very strong at the end of last year. Mike himself felt that the offseason hurt the progress that they were making as a team. They would have liked the season to keep going. That's right. He was moving good. He had momentum coming out of the, the season, and the offseason kind of slowed him down. But, you know, Mike Pagel's getting his baptism. He's getting all his learning experience right there in actual game type situations a lot of young quarterbacks come in the league they get to learn the position from sitting on the bench and watching veteran quarterbacks work but he didn't have that luxury here in indianapolis with the colts bagel now six of 13 100 yards two interceptions from the 47 of the colts and you see the timeouts for me spread out by Pagel, fires it on a rope behind Tracy Porter, there's a great catch by Porter, it was well behind him you talk about concentration great catch by Porter, Pagel threw that ball on timing, he threw it before Porter came out of the break and you get that head around, you can find that football and make that catch Colts wasted some time before they called timeout. Now watch Tracy Porter, 87 here. Right, again, it's the same play. This time Porter squares the route off because the cornerback's on him pretty good. And he comes out of his break, and that ball is already on the way. He gets that head around. You young receivers got to get that head around when you come around the break, find that football, and make a catch. Almost a one-handed catch there by Tracy Porter. He was shaken up on the play. It was good Vic hit by Leonard Smith. Victor Heflin out of Delaware State, the free agent. There is what Tracy Porter did last week. That's a career best. So you saw when the Colts put 35 points on the board, Porter had a career best, Pagel had a career best, but they forget about that right now. They're just thinking, getting on the board. The man without the helmet is Art Schleister, former quarterback for Ohio State, who has not thrown a pass in the NFL. He had a great career with the Buckeyes, of course, and then the suspension from the commissioner, Coach Cush, feeling that he can help this Colts squad. You know, Jim, actually, Schleister had a better preseason than Pagel, but Pagel's the man right now, and if they have to go to Schleister, he's very capable. At half 
side. Scores and highlights with Brendan Irv and that giant surprise on Bill Parcells and the New York Giants, who are 2-0. and Lawrence Taylor leading that tremendous defense. That should be a, a real head-smacking game down at RFK when they strap it on to the, later today. That's right. Well, the Giants are catching everybody right. They caught the Dallas Cowboys after a Monday night game. It's very tough to come out of a Monday night game and play that next week. Uh, the next Sunday, and they're catching the Rock Washington Redskins in that same situation, so let's see if they can take advantage of that. The Colts are out of timeouts. Line of scrimmage, the 36 of St. Louis. They need about 20 yards to get in field goal range. There's a tremendous catch by Booza. You talk about concentration. Not only was he down, he had to keep both feet in bounds. Not feet. He was on his knees. He had to keep his knees in bounds on that play. He's made two great catches here today. He had time to pray and say, oh, keep my feet. <laughs> That's right. Feet don't fail me now. That's right. You know, concentrate. You want to concentrate on the football, but you got to know where you are on that sideline also. And Boozer just dropped. He knew he couldn't go any further. He just dropped to his knees and made a heck of a catch. If he is not out of bounds, time expires. They could not stop the clock. Now there's 11 seconds left. You've got time for Pagel to throw, I would anticipate, either a corner pattern or a post pattern here. If the receiver's covered, you just throw it away. Stop That's right. You've got to go into the end zone with this pass. So if, nobody, if you don't catch it, make sure nobody catches it. We come at it and kick a field goal to try to get three points. Motion across. That's Phil Smith out of San Diego State. Pagel, look out. Incomplete. Might have been deflected. Looking in the general direction of Butler, but I believe that Curtis Greer and Bubba Baker now, Bubba Baker goes over and puts his finger in the eye of Jim Mills. Right in front of Jerry Seaman. I mean, Bubba Baker just went over and stuck his finger in the helmet of Mills. Well, I guess Mills got Baker a little frustrated, and this is what happens when your team is moving well. Oh, more penalties. Something's going on. begin to edge out onto the field. They're trying to cool Baker down. Keep him away from the officials so he can, he can cause problems he, and they possibly get ejected from the game. Personal foul, unnecessary roughness, number 60, defense. Personal foul, unnecessary roughness, defense. Both penalties will be enforced. Now Wayne Smith is trying to restrain him. Now what if Bubba wanted to go back and get Mills? Do you think Smith can stop him? Well, there is Mills out of the University of Hawaii, a ninth-round draft pick. Grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And there was no question about Baker poking his eye. And now Jim Hannafin has called Baker over and hopes that he can have his defensive lineman around for the second half. Both penalties enforced by Jerry Seaman. The line of scrimmage was the 14-yard line. being a bit of a free spirit. He talked about his attention span being shortchanged by 21 minutes. He was only joking when he said it, but he certainly lost his perspective on things right there. He lost concentration, but it really doesn't hurt the team because they're in field goal position anyway. Just got to move closer on the field goal attempt. Dean Biasuki out of Western Carolina, out of the hold of Ron Stark, has put the Colts on top by three just before halftime. Tempers flare again. Down on the field, McMillan. Gets into it with number 52 of the Cardinals, Charlie Baker. Well, it's going to set up an interesting second half. Both teams are hot right now. I would not want to be the offensive lineman that has to face Bubba Baker first snap in the second half. Well, we're going we're to see who gets that call. Well, they have got to get Bubba to put a little ice water on him. Yeah, he's got to cool down because, you know, these penalties in the flow of the game can really be critical was personal foul pen penalty. Yeah, quite a contrast because when Bubba talked with us last night at the hotel, he said, I have matured so much more since I played with the Lions. Well, something must have happened to him to trigger, to trigger uh, his problems here. And uh, you can see him on the sideline explaining to the players what, what, ex what actually happened. And you don't think there's a little Jekyll Hyde there. You put on a helmet and... Uh, well, you know, you get out on that field, and a lot of things can happen. You can change your personality two or three times within one football game, believe me. Want to know about Bob?
Bubba Baker's reading habits. He said, I read trash. I got stacks of National Enquirers in my basement. My wife said she wanted to use them for the dog. I said, no way. <laughs> From the 35, Bayasuki, who just made it a 17-14 Colts advantage, will spot it and probably not give Stump Mitchell too much to work with. A little split kick. Clock will start when it's fielded at the 19-yard line by Willard Harrell. And Harrell will run out the first half. Colts are fired up, but now we got a free-for-all down at the 30-yard line. That's Braceland. And look out if Bubba's coming from the other side. We'll never get him off the field. Braceland mixing it up with Stanford May. Barry Krause is out there now. Sports Saturday next week with Philip Brown and Jerry Cooney. We're going to have more boxing in the second half. <laughs> it's been a good first half here in the Hoosier Dome. The Colts, by virtue of a field goal, lead at 17-14. 30 minutes more coming up. It it Owens Corning Fiberglass Corporation, makers of Owens Corning's pink fiberglass insulation. Jim Kelly and Drew Pearson, welcome back to the Hoosier Dome. Welcome back to Bubba Baker's world as he tried to get his head strapped on straight after that demonstration just be in before the end of the first half when he stuck his finger under the helmet of Jim Mills of the Colts and was slapped with two consecutive personal foul penalties. I pity the man that has to block Bubba on his first play to start the second half. You don't think they'll <laughs> double-team him at all, do you? They're going to stay away from him. Right? That's what I would do. He has been stalking on the sidelines, waiting to get back in there. How about some halftime statistics? Two turnovers for the Baltimore Colts as far as interceptions go. One fumble was lost. Two turnovers for the Cardinals. What do you see there? Big difference. I think the big difference or the surprising thing is the ease the Colts have been able to run the football. 116 yards rushing in the first half. And I think on the negative side for the Cardinals, you know, their offense is a lot better. Over 150 yards uh, total offense last week. So far only 109 uh, total yards here in the first half. Well, but how about the 48 yards passing for Lomax? Yeah, that's, that's our all-time low, I imagine, for Lomax in the first half. And, you know, he's a much better quarterback in, than that, and we expect more from him in the second half. I mean, we are talking about a man who rewrote the record book when he was at Portland State, came to the Cardinals as a second-round draft pick, and once threw seven touchdown passes in a single game against Delaware State when he was in college. Bayasuchi from the 35 to start the second half. High end-over-end kick. It sends Stump Mitchell two yards deep in the end zone. Wall set up on the right side, but the Colts sealed it off. Good specialty team play, and they don't even reach the 20-yard line. Greg Braceland, who was fired up at the end of the first half, starts the second stanza the same way. Return. The Cardinals like to use their special teams to get themselves good field position, and Stump Mitchell is probably the best kick returner in the National Football League, and uh, the, the Colts so far have corralled him and kept the Cardinals deep inside their own territory on kickoff returns. The Colts are fired up. Their fans in Indianapolis are as well, and the best way Don Fuller tells us to silence the home crowd is with a long, sustained scoring drop. Let's see what the Cardinals have in their playbook as they start first half, second half. Otis Anderson, big hole, left side. Across the 20, up near the 22-yard line. Picks up four, brings up second down and six. And James Burroughs, in his third year, has two interceptions. He is having some football game. Well, he's going to be a top cornerback before he's through. And he's just really learning position. It's his third year, and he's very fluid and very smooth back there. And he has some good hands. So if the ball's in his area and he has a play on it, most of the time, he's going to come up with the interception. 57th player pick in the 82 draft. Colts very high. Lettered in football, basketball, and track in high school. Second and six. Lomax out of the pocket. Wide open over the middle, and it's behind Pat Tilly. Tilly was wide open. Green was... Did they have a mix-up there? Because all of a sudden, both wide receivers are taking their defensive men to the same zone. I think the problem was Tilly didn't expect the football. They were, I think they were running, both outside receivers were running clearing routes, trying to open something up underneath. 
And there's Lomax, throws it, and you see the receiver, the tight end, and Doug Marsh is open underneath until he doesn't even see the ball because all he's doing is clearing it out. He was not the intended receiver on that play. And on that replay from the end zone, you saw the tight end, Doug Marsh, was open over the middle. They, haven't, they only gone, have gone to Marsh one time. He could be a factor in the second half. Cedric Mack comes out wide to the left side, number 47. Third year out of Baylor, used to be a defensive back. Roy Green, Pat Kelly wide right. Lomax looks over third and six. Roy Green, first down at the 37-yard line. James Burroughs on the coverage. You can't throw it any better than that. Well, that's the timing we've grown accustomed to Lomax and Green having. And again, Burroughs is on man-to-man -man coverage with Roy Green. And Roy, good explosion off the line of scrimmage. Green is playing to the outside. and I mean, Burroughs is playing to the outside, and that's where Green wants to go. He gives him that little burst to get him going upfield, then breaks it off outside. You see, that time he kind of squir squared his route off, did not round it off, therefore they had the timing to make the completion. Roy Green told us last night that lack of execution a year ago, Cardinals could play great and awful in the same game. Otis Anderson, Convoy Wright, bangs up across the 40, down to the 42-yard line. In the grasp of number 56, Vernon Maxwell. Maxwell, Frank Kirsch tells us, an excellent athlete, taking time to learn the defensive schemes of things. But he, he's one of the guys that actually goes home from practice and takes a projector home with him. And he has all the ability in the world, and still he, he gets himself ready by preparing himself as far as studying films and things like that are concerned. And if you have that ability and that type of preparation, it's going to help your game. He was the NFL Rookie of the Year last year. Chris wanted him. He knew him in high school. Second and five. Otis Anderson shifts over. That means Lomax with an audible. We'll throw. We'll fire. We'll get his man, Roy Green. Hammered out by James Burrow. That should be a Cardinal first down up near the 47-yard line of St. Louis. They approach midfield. Jim, they've been working on Burroughs' side, but on the other side, they got a rookie in Eugene Daniel, who also has a hamstring problem. Missed a couple days of practice this past week, and, but they haven't tested him yet. That man is... We thought he was licking his chops last night at the hotel with their game plan. He wants back in there. Look at on your mark. Get set. Go, Bubba, go. <laughs> he wants to get in there fast. There's the beat. <laughs> First and ten, St. Louis. Lomax looks, fires. Roy Green got his man beaten. Roy Green drops it at the six. Eugene Daniel was beaten. You don't see Roy Green drop too many like that. Not like that. We, we I just said that they want to. They haven't been working on Daniel's side, and that time they went after him, and it looked like he was limping a little bit with that bad hamstring. And Green went by him. Here's where the concentration comes in. You got to keep your eyes on the ball. You see Green's eyes were not on the ball, and consequently, the drop pass. Neil Lomax, who was all the way back at the 30-yard line, and as the ball fell incomplete, he had both hands up in his helmet. Nothing I can do but lay it in there, Roy. That's right. That makes that walk back to the huddle awful long for your receivers, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very tough to drop one out and open like that. But, you know, Roy Green is a class receiver. He's one of the top receivers in this business. Had a great year last year, and I'm sure he'll be back into the floor with him. Neil Lomax, 7 of 21, 69 yards, second and 10 from his own 47. Philly left, Green right. Otis Anderson, we're going to block from Philly. He did most of that on his own. Well, that time they had Maxwell, the li outside linebacker, lined up like a defensive end, giving them a four-man front look, and they blocked it down inside, caved the defensive line inside, gave Anderson some running room to the outside. How about you wide receivers when you get a chance to throw a block on a cornerback? When you're running pass routes, you're the one on the receiving end of the hit. Now you get a chance for the equalizer. That's right. That's what we call out the payback, you know? When you got backs like Otis Anderson, Curtis Dickey running in your offense, you got to work downfield because you never know when these guys are going to break you. Third and two, Anderson alone running back. Marsh the tight end, slotted left inside of Pat Philly. Roy Green, top of your screen. Lomax will throw for the first down. Roy Green drops it at the 32. Hit put on by James Burrow. Roy Green having a rough afternoon. They just, they just signed their number one draft choice, Clyde Duncan. So these guys better start catching because they got somebody waiting in the wings that wants to play. And again, Burroughs is right there on the coverage. He's right there with a pretty good hit as well. He's yeah, not he's afraid a, to put his helmet in there. He's a hitter, Jim. I 
think Bubba's glad they didn't get a first down there. He's ready to get back in there. <laughs> I'll tell you what, there's steam coming out of that. Look at that. I think he was rooting uh, against his offensive team in that series. He's ready to go. Colts better have some running plays called. They better not let Bubba have a clear shot at Pagel, or Pagel will be halfway to Market Street Arena. Eugene Daniel is back deep. First song bangs it away. High, high, end over end kick. Daniel will let it hit at the 15. Made a mistake. Cardinals will try to kill it inside the five. They let it roll. It is dead at the one yard line. Eugene Daniel should have made a fair catch on that at the 15 yard line. It sets the Colts up in a huge hole. And guess who's the first player out? Number 6 0, Bubba Baker. <laughs> Look out, Mama. 17 14. Colts. 73 for the Colts in the huddle bending over. You think he's saying, guys, I might need some help? I think so. He's got to face Bubba Baker, and Bubba's ready. Let's see what happens here. A little smoke and a little steam. Colts lead by three, but they start from their own one. Bagel to McMillan. Dives off the left side, picks up three tough yards. Let's see what went on down in the pits. Well, not really much happening here. Very first, a typical first play, especially on a, your own one-yard line. And Steve Wright, he just sticks his head in there, and Bubba just kind of waffles with him. Advantage to Wright. That's right. Did a night. Be like Saturday night big-time wrestling. Where's Lord Layton? <laughs> Second down and six. Coming out wide to the right side. Tracy Porter. Back to split. McMillan and Curtis Dickey. McMillan. Close to first down yardage, slithers up near the 10. Third and one, and the Colts left side doing a good job. Chris Hinton, Ben Utt, and you notice they're running away from That's Bubba right. Baker. That's right. Well, these Colts are no uh, dummy football team. They know Bubba Baker's fired up, pumped up, and they're kind of going the other way. Sometimes you can trap a player. You can take advantage of over-aggressive. That's right, especially get them going upfield and run inside of them. We got a third and one situation. Might be a good time to come back toward Bubba Baker's side right now. He's got him overcommitted. Tim Sherwin, Dave Young, Mark Bell. Three tight ends in there for the Colts. They need to cross the 11. Crowd will tell you. First down, Indianapolis. And there's an offensive line doing a good job. The defense set to play run, and this is what we talked about at halftime. This is why Indianapolis has been so effective. Well, they went three times that time at Chris Hinton's side. That's their strong side of their running game, the offensive left side, and they ran three plays from the one-yard line on Chris Hinton's side, and they picked up a first down, ball on the 13-yard line. Chris Hinton, number 75, a pro bowler, his rookie year. Line of scrimmage, the 13 for the Colts. Motion across by Tracy Porter. He's got a touchdown catch. Bagel gives to Curtis Dickey. Big hole left side. First down and more. Oh. Ben Hutt and Chris Hinton. How do you do? That was a convoy. Well, the Cardinals came in this game knowing that the Colts would run the football, and that's just what the Colts are doing. You can see the blocks by Hutt and Chris Hinton. Chris Hinton comes down on the tackle, and Hutt pulls. Creates a big hole in there for Curtis Dickey. Not too many people like to bring him down when he gets a full head of steam. Especially if you're a safety man, alone one-on-one. -on -one. Dickey now, 14 carries, 83 yards. Play action takes Hagel. Unloads, he's got Curtis Dickey out of the backfield. Hammered backwards at the 35. Close to first down yardage for Curtis Dickey. And an injured Cardinal in the backfield of the Colts. Number 75, Curtis Greer. Getting up slowly and holding on to his left wrist. He came crashing through and tried to sack Pagel. Boy, if they can isolate Curtis Dickey one-on-one -on -one out of the backfield, you're going to have a foot race. That's right. Dickey's a good receiver. He caught 24 passes last year, and he just comes out of that backfield. He's got that great speed. If you put a linebacker on him, most of the time he's going to beat that linebacker. Alvin Moore, number 23, checks in. Second year running back out of Arizona State. Seventh round pick of the Colts back in 83. Cousin of Leroy and Dewey Selman, and he replaces Curtis Dickey, who gets a bit of a run. Jumping offside is Curtis Greer, who will point to the Colts and say he was drawn offside. Jerry Seaman will have the final word. 8.32 left to go in the third quarter. The Colts lead by three, 17 to 14. 
doubleheader Sunday here on CBS. The 2-0 Giants, the 0-2 Redskins, and then the Eagles and the Cowboys. And we were talking about that finger pointing going on down in Dallas. They got the offensive players blaming the coaches and a lot of people uh, pointing fingers. Well, Coach Landry came out in the news in the press. He had a team meeting with the players. Really got really got on the players about making statements about the coaching staff in the in the to the press and now the players are mum about all situations so now, what they put the clamps some on. of the players said that the uh, the offense was not prepared for the giants blitzes right the giants lawrence taylor sacked gary hogan and caused him to fumble twice one would led to a touchdown but something that usually picked up by a line or or a tight end and it didn't happen in that game second and six for the colts who lead by three inside and the foul and more knife down at the 33 yard line in the grasp of bob harris who was a safety in college plays the right side linebacker second year out of auburn well, this is the this is the indianapolis coast style they want to run that ball create situations like third and two that's where they know how that way that way they don't have to put that ball in the air and throw the football their strength is in their running game here comes curtis dickey back in the ball game there's some strength there as well colts leading ground gainer came in with three and a half yard average 124 yards and two touchdowns packed on a 10-yard touchdown run to give the colts a seven nothing lead they need two three tight ends dickey will get it almost breaks it big up to the 39 lionel washington hanging on and bubba baker is down in the backfield that time, that time, Jim, excuse me, they took advantage of Bubba's aggressiveness. He got him going upfield and cut right inside of him. You see Baker getting a low charge, coming upfield, but over-penetrating, and Dickey runs right by him, cuts it inside, a block there by Ron Salt, and picks up the first down. Remember, this drive started back at the Colts' one-yard line. They moved it out of danger zone, and they're marching right down the field. All on the ground. Quarter left, Butler right. Curtis Dickey up the middle. And he just kind of turned sideways that time. The hole wasn't there. He kind of taxied his way through. Right, he just kind of slivered through there. And a lot of times that hole is not there. You, or if it's there, it's not going to be much daylight. And you got to make your daylight and get through that daylight the best you can. What happens to a defensive team now? You come in with your game plan so prepared on stopping the run. The Colts running almost at will first and second half. You've got to make some adjustments, but so far nothing's working. Well, they should have made some adjustments at halftime because what they did in the first half was not, not working, and they need to make adjustments here to stop the Colts. Second and three. Butler right. Porter left. Pagel gives off to Curtis Dickey. First down for the Colts at the 48-yard line of St. Louis. Curtis Dickey. Over that right side, 17 carries as he approaches 100 yards. Duda and Baker hanging on, but look from ground level. Well, they've been running left. They go right this time. Steve Wright gets a good block, and Ron Salt, the rookie from Maryland, gives Dickey some running room, and Dickey's been running that football. You he might have seen a right arm in there, E.J. Jr. He tried to strip the football, Curtis Dickey. Well, even if the Colts don't score on this drive, they did themselves a world of good by getting out of that their own territory in that bad field position that they have. And they're using up a lot of time. Alvin Moore replaces Curtis Dickey. Moore, number 23. Play action fake. Curtis Greer putting pressure on Pagel. Pagel unloads. Tracy Porter's got it. First down for the Colts. That's where Pagel's strength is. He can avoid that rush and buy some time back there throwing that football. And while he's buying that time, the receivers can work open. And that time he picked up the open receiver, Tracy Porter, who's having a real good football game. So there it's it Mike Pagel. Watch him dodge Curtis Greer. Greer Just getting steps inside. You see, hit and staying right with him. Steps up in the pocket. Good pass on the run. Nice lead to Tracy Porter to pick up the first down. Who does Pagel remind you of with a good strength on the ball when he throws on the run? Any quarterback you played against or with? Well, Joe Theismann and Joe Montana, those are great innovators as far as avoiding the rush and making something happen downfield. Pitch back, Curtis Dickey, Alvin Moore, Alvin Moore, bump backwards. What a collision at the 24-yard line. E.J. Jr., talk about taking a tackle secure. But when Alvin Moore watched watch the film tomorrow, he's going to say, I should have went outside on that play because that's where the daylight was. He starts to go outside, get some good lead block in there from Randy McMillan. Well, he just kind of fell down there, but he should have took that thing outside and, and ran off of McMillan's tail. Probably would have picked up some bigger yards. Line of scrimmage, the 24 of the Cardinals. Keep in mind, this drive started back at the Indianapolis one-yard line. 
Colts lead by three, 17-14. 4-15 left third quarter. Dickey and McMillan, the running back for Pagel. Butler left, quarter right. Play action fake, look out. Pagel in trouble. Crashing through is Bob Harris out of Auburn. Bob Harris smelled this play out all the way. It's play action pass. Again, going to the right, and there's Harris. He's blitzing on the play, so therefore he puts him in a great position to, to uh, put the stops to Pagel. Think Harris may have said something at the end of that play? No, there's been a lot of uh, intensity out here, a lot of temper swearing, so this is a heated game, and rightly so, because the score is only 17-14. Both teams are very much in this football game. Four quarterback sacks for the sack attack from the St. Louis Cardinals. Slot formation to the right side. Third and 14 now. Cardinals will be coming. Pagel knows it. Floating pocket right side. Greer from behind. Hammers Pagel. The ball is incomplete. The Colts fans will want a roughing the passer, but no flag was thrown. Jerry Seaman right in the vicinity. Curtis Greer came around from behind, and Pagel was looking at Bubba Baker coming the other way. That's when you get out the Bible and pray. That's right. You know, a lot of times you talk about quarterback sacks, but quarterback pressures are just as important as quarterback sacks. To make that quarterback hurry his throw and throw the timing off between the quarterback and the receiver. Dean Biasucci, who won a four-man kickoff for the Colts after Raul Allegro went down in to try a field goal. Ron Stark, he will hold. This will be a 50-yarder for a young man who, not too long ago, was just a student. Had no idea he'd be playing for the Colts. Five for five extra points a year ago, and this one is good! 50-yarder for Dean Biasucci. And that would have been good from 58 or 59. He's got a strong leg, got a lot on that ball, and he cleared the goalpost and had a lot to spare. He was a fifth-year theater major in Western Carolina, and watch this one. You talk about a good leg. Good leg, good height on the ball coming off the, off the ground. Good protection by the Colts up front. Boy, that thing clears it and has a plenty of room to spare. He packed up so quickly from college that he had to borrow clothes from Raul Allegra for the trip to Houston. This kid's just a youngster, and okay, no problem, just another day at the office. Colts lead the Cardinals by six from the 35-yard line. Dean Basuchi, five for five against the Oilers a week ago. This young man really plays well under pressure. Well, he's got a strong leg. He kicks that ball deep, and he's a good kickoff man because he gets that ball in the end zone. This one will send Scott Mitchell three yards deep. If he gets a block, he's gone. Up to the 25. That's a great return. A 28-yard return off a very high and deep kick from Dean Biasucci. First and 10 for the Cardinals, who've fallen behind by six. That man, Biasucci, with two field goals and two extra points so far this afternoon. Cardinals have to come back. And they've got still three and a half left third quarter, all of the fourth quarter. Tired of St. Louis, Doug Marsh and Greg LaFleur. There's our score, three and a half left third quarter. Pat Philly still looking for his first reception wide to the left. Motion by Marsh across, Lomax underneath to Anderson. He's got three blockers in front of him. Otis Anderson, first down for the Cardinals up at the 48-yard line. Field. Do you hear all this noise, or can you blank it out? No, you got to hear it. Because if you're the visiting team, it, kinda, it has to distract you. And if you're a receiver out there trying to hear the snap count, and St. Louis likes to audibleize a lot, you're trying to pick up the snap count, and all this noise going on, it just makes it extra tough on the receivers, the outside people. First down after that reception, Pat Billy comes out wide to the left side. Roy Green to the top of your screen. The backs are now in the eye for set. Earl Farrell, the up back. Anderson in the tailback spot for Lomax. They won't waste time. Lomax looks to the left. Pumps. He's got Tilly, and he missed him at the 40-yard line of the Colts. They've got a wild one going at the Metrodome in Minneapolis. Let's find out how the Vikings are doing against the Falcons. Here again is Brent Musburger. Jim, the Vikings are doing extremely well. Suddenly, they are just moving up and down the field on the Falcons. Alfred Anderson with his second touchdown pass from the halfback option in two weeks. Dwight Collins, and now the Vikes lead 27-13. to 13. Back to Jim. 
Alfred Anderson out of Baylor had a great game last week against Philadelphia. He threw a touchdown pass to Tommy Kramer. 2.33 left to go. The wave continues in Indianapolis. Second and 10. Lomax fires. Roy Green got it inside Colts territory. A great catch. And what a collision. Eugene Daniel and Nesby Glasgow. And Roy Green felt that one. Oh, that's the Drew zone. That's that inside. You catch those, you got to pay for it. Ned the Glasgow led the team in reception, um, excuse me, in tackles for the last three years for the Colts. And there's Green coming inside. He takes a good while from Glasgow on the way down. Glasgow's a hitter back there, and that's secondary. Does that do anything to get Roy Green's confidence back because he had a tough first half? Sure, that, that catch has got to fire him up. You can catch him inside like that. You can catch him anywhere. Slot formation to the right side. Now they've got three wide receivers over there. March to tight end, Philly and Green. They try to set it up for Otis Anderson, who cracks inside the 35. We got another fight. Otis Anderson didn't like the way he was tackled. Nesby Glasgow was in there along with Cliff Odom. And now we got another fight. At 68 for the Cardinals. On the offensive line, Terry Steve, and he's mixing it up with 93 for the Colts. Cliff Odom. Well, speaking about fights, coming up on CBS Sports Saturday. Yesterday, Hitman Hearns back in action. Next Saturday on the 29th. We've got Philip Brown in action against Jerry Cooney. Cooney after that long, long layoff since that bout in Las Vegas for the heavyweight championship against Larry Holmes. Ten-round heavyweight bout on CBS Sports Saturday next week. Find out if Cooney's mental and physical toughness is back. A crowd trying to spur on the Colts defense. Lomax looks in, second and five. Otis Anderson. Inside the 30. Somebody lost a shoe down at the 33. Leo Wisniewski, third year out of Penn State. Oh, he's a good one, too. He's very active, very quick inside. Not, not really big, but he gets that football. He makes a lot of tackles. There it is, the coach. You see Johnny Cook there, normally a linebacker, but playing defensive end this year. Kind of stringing the play out, forces Anderson to cut back. And there's the pursuit of the Colts defense finishing off the play. Frank Cush told us the other day at the Colts practice about Johnny Cook. Nobody, no young man ever had a better attitude about having to change position. Third and three for Lomax. Colts are coming. Lomax, quick release. Roy Green chopped down, incomplete, 18-yard line. James Burrow. He has been picking Roy Green's pocket all afternoon. I guarantee if Roy Green did not know about James Burrow before this game, he knows about him now. Bur Burrows has been all over, but Green should have had this ball. Lomax kind of waits on him, brings the ball in there. Green just drops it, and Burrows just finishes them off. Defense gets a standing O here in the Hoosier Dome. I don't think James Burrows gets a game ball, regardless of the outcome of this football game. He's playing a heck of a game. Benny Perrin will hold Neil O'Donohue, a young man who Jim Hannafin told us last night he's got as much mental toughness as anybody. Cardinal fans know what a rocky year Neil O'Donohue had. Hannafin still has confidence in him, and O'Donohue rewards Hannafin with a field goal try that is good. A 47-yarder from Neil O'Donohue to bring the Cardinals back to within three. Colts lead St. Louis 2017, and we've got five seconds left to go in quarter number three. Here is Jim Hannafin as he watches. Uh, no problem. See, I told you O'Donohue could kick it. That's He's correct. got a good, strong leg. His problem has been accuracy. Cardinals trail the Colts by three. Football game, and it's a long way from over. Home crowd, sellout crowd here at the Hoosier Dome. O'Donohue, a high, high, deep end over end kick. It backs Bill Smith up to the four. 15, 20. Look out. One man can catch him. Turn out the lights. I guess that would qualify as a spontaneous celebration. That's not exactly taunting. I would say so. They are burying Smith down in the tunnel. Most of the Colts are all the way across the field. That looks like a college celebration. That rah-rah type attitude that Coach Cush has instilled in this football team. 
Barry Krauss over on the near sideline with a white towel waving it, and there is Mr. Smith, a 96-yard touchdown return. The Cardinals close to within three, and all of a sudden they'll end the third quarter behind by ten. They're alive at the Dome in Indianapolis. Bill Smith, the second-year man from San Diego State. 96-yard touchdown return on a kickoff. Pretty good way to seal the third quarter. Biggest lead of the football game could be 10 points if Dean Biasucci converts. He's been perfect so far. He's 5-for-5 five five against the Oilers. He's got two and two field goals, and he missed it wide to the left. Let's take another look at that 96-yard touchdown return. It didn't even silence the crowd when he missed the extra point. They're still alive over this one. Watch how quick Bill Smith gets into the block, gets into the wedge. When he does that, he gets to that second wave, and it's all over at this point already. Smith has good speed. The only man that can possibly catch him is Neil O'Donohue. Bill no Kelly has a shot at him, number 22. He'll come in from the left side of your screen. He's a reserve cornerback from Purdue. But Phil Smith is off to the races. He looked like slew of gold in the Woodward yesterday down that home stretch. That's the end of the third quarter with the score. The Colts 26, the Cardinals 17. We'll pause now for a word from your local station. General Motors. Sears, where you'll find great values. There's more for your life at Sears. And by Honda Motorcycles, inventors of the ATC three-wheeler. Honda, follow the leader. Jim Kelly and Drew Pearson, welcome back to the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis as you look at Bill Smith, who just broke one 96 yards to end the third quarter. First play of the fourth quarter. Bayasuchi to stump Mitchell at the five. 15. Tries to turn the corner. Loses the football out of bounds at the 23-yard line. James Burroughs, who's carving out an all-pro career here this afternoon against the Cardinals, the man that stripped him of the football and wrestled him out of bounds. Few Colts fans watching back in Maryland or elsewhere. Give you a little trivia question. When was the last time a Colt ran back a kickoff for a touchdown? I'll give you a second or two to think about that. All right. Hint, Jim. While you ponder that question, college football here on CBS Sports next Saturday. The Corn Huskers and the Bruins. You think there's some firepower in those two? That's the Big Eight going against the Pac-10. First and ten, Cardinals, they trail by nine. Green to the right. Silly, who has yet to catch a pass to the left. Play action, Lomax out of the pocket. Wants Green, got Green. Does he hang on? Bumps out of bounds at the 44. James Burroughs was right there, but that time Roy Green had him beat, and that time he hung on to the football. Now Green got him going like he was going deep. He came back, and Lomax on a rollout to that same size, fired it to him for a 20-yard gain. All right, for our Colts fans and the trivia question, the last time a Colt ran back a kickoff for a touchdown was 1978. Joe Washington, 90 yards. We'll check around the NFL today after the snap of the ball. It's first and 10 from the 44. We'll check before the snap of the ball. Vikings leading, Bears leading. Doubleheader Sunday, so Brent Nerve back in the studio, scores and highlights all day long. Lomax gives to Otis Anderson. Huge hole left side, but a penalty flag thrown from across the field. Otis Anderson cracks it up near midfield in the grasp of Nesby Glasgow. We'll check the call and the scoreboard. Jets up big over the Bengals. Bengals just cannot get on track. Kansas City still on top, but the Raiders coming back. Todd Blackledge, big game. New England coming back. Seattle had a shutout going at one point. Patriots at home at Foxborough. And, of course, this is doubleheader Sunday, so some of you will see the Giants and the Redskins next. Others will see the Eagles and the Cowboys next. them up five and negates a five-yard pickup by Otis Anderson. So now it's first and 15. 26-17, the Colts. I think it's going to get noisy, partner. I think so. The Cardinals need to get something going here. It's a critical series for them right here coming up. Silly, top of your screen, green to the bottom. Marsh to tight end in a slot right. Motions across. 
little delay to Anderson. They had it set up well to the 50 and keeps on going, and that is very close to a Cardinal first down. Boy, that play was set up beautiful. That's right. That was vintage O.J. Anderson there. He gets those legs going. He feels the contact, and he just keeps going there. Lomax stands up, makes it look like a pass play, gives it to Anderson on a bit of a draw. They had Marsh out there leading the blocking. Green came back. He threw a block right there. Look at that leg drive. Look at that leg drive. What do you, what do you want to bring him down? There's three guys on him. Go down, Otis Anderson. Might be a good time to go deep to either Tilly or Green. You've got second down and about a foot and a half. LaFleur comes in to be the other tight end with Doug Marsh. Now they've got Tilly set up in a slot formation with Green near right side. They haven't used Tilly all day. Let's see if they go to him. Haven't gotten him the ball. Pump fake. They want Green. Green's out there. And it is a St. Louis score. There it is. That out and up. Sideline takeoff. Hold it. There's a penalty flag at midfield. Jerry Seaman will talk it over with the Colts. Let's check the flag. Lomax is walking off, so the indication is Jerry Seaman. Right to the foul. Roughing the passer, number 56, defense, touchdown is good. A 15-yard penalty will be assessed on the kickoff. They've been, Burroughs has been real aggressive. They were running these sideline routes. Lomax will pump it, gives him a step to the outside, and just takes it right up inside between two defenders. Eugene Daniel and James Burroughs, look how wide open he is. Those are some tough catches. Good concentration by Roy Green. What goes through his mind? Now, he's had such a rough afternoon. He dropped one like that earlier in the first half. Well, you can see he put that out of his mind because his concentration was perfect on that play. And it was a great pass by Lomax, a great pump to get the defense to, to commit when Green fell right behind him. 76 yards in three plays, less than two minutes, and out of the hold of Benny Perra, Neil O'Donohue has brought the Cardinals back to within just two points. That missed extra point could become very crucial. The Colts lead the Cardinals by two, almost 14 minutes to play. A lot of penalty play. It is probably against the Cardinals, simply because the way O'Donohue hit the ball, I gotta believe maybe somebody jumped offside because O'Donohue's timing was so bad. Yeah, he didn't uh, take his normal steps on that kickoff. Offside, kicking team, re-kick, five-yard penalty. Next week around the NFL, where will you be? Well, I'll be uh, in uh, Detroit. I hope right, so. Against Minnesota. That should be a good game. And the Cardinals will be in New Orleans. Philadelphia is at home against the 49ers. Patriots at home against the Redskins. Rams in Cincinnati. Of course, the Redskins, they've got a big battle on their hands in a few minutes here on CBS. And, of course, doubleheader Sunday next week as well. Two other good games, the Packers and the Cowboys. And then Franco Harris and Walter Payton on the same field, the Bears and Seattle. Of course, Jimmy the Greek, who picked slew of gold yesterday in the Woodward, he likes the Chicago Bears to go all the way in that black and blue NFC Central. Not a bad choice, but my surprise team, or my dark horse team this year, my sleeper team, is the St. Louis Cardinals, and they're not faring too well right now, but they're still in this ballgame. There's a lot of time left in this ballgame. Well, you can't underestimate the importance of that last touchdown toss from Neil Lomax, his fifth scoring strike of the year to Roy Green, because Green has not had a good afternoon. Lomax has had some problems. He's had some drop balls, but he misfired on Philly quite a few times, so if they can get their passing game on track, pull this football game out. Low squib kick. That's Phil Smith. Outside. And this time they hop him at the 22-yard line. That was Bill Kay, the first to get down there. So the Colts, with that two-point lead, I would imagine they would go to work on the ground a little bit. Neil Lomax wants the ball back. You see the graphic in 11 consecutive touchdowns, or 11 consecutive games for a touchdown by Neil Lomax. He had a rough afternoon, but he's a fighter. He's hanging right in there. He's got his team right back in this football game. The record for consecutive touchdown games is 16 held by Charlie Johnson, by the way. Slot to the left side. Motion by Porter across. Curtis Dickey around the ankles by Bubba Baker. Need to stick to their game plan, and that is to run the football, and that's exactly what they're doing. That's where their success comes from. And 
you see Curtis Dickey in that eye formation. You usually see that. You're going to see a running play. He gets good blocking again from Chris Hinton and Ben Utt. He picks up, creates a second and three situation. Baker, Big Bubba, took off about 20 pounds. He was up around 290. Looked like a refrigerator. And he said he couldn't tie his own shoelaces without breaking into a sweat. Second and three, Colts. They lead by two. First down, McMillan hurls his body up across the 30-yard line. Bob Harris hanging on. Cooper Baker on the tackle that time. Noted for his pass rush. He's not really that respected for his, his, the work he does against the run, but he's pretty tough. He added some, some size and strength since he's left Detroit, and he's pretty tough to work against. Time remaining left to go in this football game. And apparently they said McMillan's knee went down. They didn't give him all of his forward progress, so it's third and about the length of the football. Three tight ends in there now for the Colts. Tim Sherwin, Dave Young, and Mark Bell. 83, 81, and 48 respectively. Motion by Sherwin across. Hagel will dive for it himself, and I don't know. That's very close. That's real close. It depends on the spot. EJ Jr. and Mark Duda came hurling on in. Hagel tried to go up over the right side, blocking there by Donaldson, the center, and Solt, the right guard. Solt, the rookie out of Maryland, 6'3", 275. First round pick of the Colts. Frank Cush told us yesterday he's going to be a good one. Well, he's tough. You know, to be starting as a rookie, again, you got to learn learn the ropes while you're playing. That's, that's probably the best way to learn, gain that experience week in and week out. Important measurement. Jerry Seaman calling for the chains, and they're taking their time in getting them out there. 11.56 left to go in the football game. The Colts 26, the Cardinals 24, a missed extra point. About four or five inches shot. There is Frank Cook. And the coach, do you think that man is not intense? Somebody asked him why he likes to read biographies of Churchill and Mussolini and Hitler, and he said, what intrigues me about all those guys is how they manage people. He's a little disappointed right there. He didn't pick up that first time. I never understood why quarterback would take it on a quarterback sneak when you got running backs like Curtis Dickey and Randy McMillan in that backfield. The stumper, Stump Mitchell, back at about the 30-yard line of the Cardinals. Stark in punting. Three punts, averaging 49.3 yards per kick. So he's got the good luck. Mitchell would like to break it and set up the Cardinals. Good field position. Low snap. But Stark with a high, high spiraling kick. He hangs a beauty and allows the specialty teams to come down. It bounces backwards, though. Cardinals better get out of the way. It's bouncing around on the artificial surface down at the 33-yard line. And that's where the Cardinals and Leo Lomax will start from first and 10. 11 and a half left to go in regulation. Lots of football left in a game that has been wild and woolly. We've seen it all at the Hoosier Dome. Please, St. Louis and Patelli to the top of your screen. Roy Green to the bottom. In the eye for a set, Farrell the up back, Anderson the tailback. Otis Anderson hammered down at the 36. Picks up three at second down and seven. Cliff Odom, like a locomotive, came over to make the tackle. Good pursuit by the Colts defense. Anderson looked like he had some room, but the Colts defense, in pursuit, made the tackle. There's a nervous Jim Hannafin over on the sideline, fifth year. Very likable head coach. His players consider him to be a friend as well as a coach. Guys like to go into battle for the big likable Irish guy. Well, he's a player coach. The players really respond to him. Marsh to tight end. Top of your screen, slot to the bottom. Inside is Philly, outside is Green. Anderson, the only running back. Colts dropping back linebackers. Lomax unloads incomplete. Looked in the direction of Philly, and then those two have just been on opposite sides of the field the whole game. Well, that time Lomax was expecting Philly to come back out. He ran an in route. He expected him to adjust it and come back outside, but they never did. You see Tilly there. He's working on Eugene Dan. He goes inside. He stops there, and, and Lomax expects him to come back out to the dead area and never makes it back there. And again, Tilly and Lomax are not on the same page this Sunday. Tate Randall, number 35, free agent out of Texas Tech. One interception last year. Checks in as the nickelback for the Colts. They're on their feet at the dome. It's third and seven. To Roy Green, very close to first down yardage. That should be a St. Louis first down up at the 44-yard line. 
Roy Green, you see him wrap his arms around the ball. He wanted to make sure. That's right, Jim. All this play is designed for us to get the first down. Wherever that first down marker is, that's where that receiver has to come in. You see Tilly coming off the line. He takes the defense deep, and Green just kind of settles there, comes inside, gets the first down. Do you think James Burroughs was a little bit deep that time? I mean, he was burned for that 63-yarder, but uh, defensive backs don't forget those things too easily. Seven catches, 127 yards for Roy Green. Backs are split. Farrell and Anderson. Green to the top of the screen, to the bottom side. Pat Tilly. First and ten from the 44 of St. Louis. Lomax unloads. Incomplete looking for Anderson at midfield, and Otis wants pass interference. He will not get it. Barry Krause on the coverage. Perhaps had good coverage there. It was close, but I don't think there was any contact. Or if it was, it was incidental. It's never incidental to your receivers. Uh, <laughs> any bump we feel, we, need, we, we expect a flag. Let's see if there was some little incidental contact. On the right-hand side, you can see a little bumping there by Barry Krause as the ball is in the air. And Anderson might have had a gripe on that play. What, what might be a little bump to you from somebody 6'3", 250 would be a major hit from me. Anderson approaches midfield, keeps the knees on turning and picks up five. It'll bring up third and five in the grasp of Cliff Odom. Who is the toughest linebacker you ever played against? I have to go way back to answer that question, Jim. It was Tommy Novick when he was with the Atlanta Falcons. He hit me one time and I woke up Picked myself off the turf and thought I was at home watching the game in my living room instead of being out there on the field. Smelling salt didn't make any difference. Didn't help at all. Third and five. The Colts will tell you if they pick up a first down or not. Passing the situation for the Cardinals. Might be a good time to go to the tight end. Tight end or Tilly. They haven't used Tilly. Colts go blitz. Lomax reads it. Colts are coming. Unloads. Tilly intercepted. Tate Randall off to the races. Lomax can stop him. Penalty flag down inside the 10. The Colts are down. Tate Randall has just equaled his 83 interception with one. Couldn't have come at a better time for the Colts. And watch how far away from the receiver the ball is. Again, Lomax and Tilly having their problems this afternoon. Both are way behind Tilly. You see Tilly way out on the sideline. And Randall coming in late, but in time to make the play. Watch for the face mask. Lomax goes up top right there with the right hand. Illustration. Face mask. Joe Namath from the side. That is Tate Randall. Nickel defensive back for the Colts. 56-yard interception. You tack on the face pass penalty, so the Colts start first and goal from the four. That makes it a short field. Well, the turnovers are in favor of the Colts. Interceptions for sure, and Lomax is having a rough afternoon. It's character time now for the Cardinal defense. They are backed up against it. The offense has not played well. If they can keep the Colts out of the end zone, though, Drew, they're still in this football game. That's right. It's four down territory. They'll use four downs to get the ball in there. All on the ground, I guarantee you. Three tight ends in for the Colts. Sherwin, Young, and Bell. Hagel works with McMillan and Curtis Dickey. Curtis Dickey. He can sweep the right side. Tracks back against it. Inside the five, down to the three-yard line. Picks up one hard-earned yard. E.J. Jr., the man that came up the ceiling. All kinds of possibilities. If the Cardinals can keep the Colts out of the end zone and force Indianapolis to settle for the field goal, it's a five-point Colt lead. If the Colts take it in for the touchdown, all of a sudden it could be a nine-point advantage. 8.20 and counting. Left to go in this football game. Three tight ends again. The backs are McMillan, 32, Dickey, 33. Curtis Dickey will try the left side. Gang tackling by the Cardinals, and they lose two yards. Well, they got him out of the four-down territory. They're going to have to throw the ball in this situation. Kurt Allerman, number 51, out of Penn State, a free agent. He must have did some scouting in preparation for this play, and he smells it out all the way, and Dickey tries to cut it back. Nothing doing. And 
Wayne Smith, who has an interception number 44, also in there on the tackle. So it's third down. How about play action here? Good situation. They've been running the ball a lot. Play action. Quick at the linebackers to hold. Sneak a tight end behind them. Hagel motions Dickey, top of the screen. Dickey's wide open. Hagel can't get it to him. Comes back, tight end, touchdown. Dave Young. They had that one set up extremely well. Dickey out of the backfield, out of the flat. He was open, but when he was open, Mike Hagel couldn't throw it to him. You can see here Pago on a sprint out. This is what he does best. He throws slow on the run. He wants Dickey first. If not there, he's going to wait till the tight end on the other side comes open and happens to be Dave Young. He's wide open in the end zone. Good throw by Pago throwing back across his body. Running to the right, throwing back across his body on a dead run, almost a jump pass. Out of the hole of Ron Stark, Dean Biasucci. Missed one today, the only one he's missed in a short career with the Colts. And this one is perfect. Another penalty flag is down at the 10. It's a personal foul. McMillan got into it with number 45 for the Cardinals, Leonard Smith. They got two rock solid players there. The extra point is good. And let's take another look and watch Pagel throwing back against his body. On a play like this, Jim, you got three options. You got the back coming out, that's your first option. You got the tight end on the other side. Third option, and Pago picks the third option. Go across his body, good zip on the ball, touchdown, Colt. A nine point Colt lead, the personal foul penalty assessed against the Cardinals on the kickoff. If you want to do work like an expert, it helps to have the mind of a craftsman. tight end Dave Young. His hometown is Akron, Ohio, a free agent out of Purdue. Dave Young came in in the two games the Colts had played. A loss to the New York Jets and that big win over the Oilers with no catches. Well, he's caught three here this afternoon for 47 yards. And uh, the last one for the touchdown, which gives the Colts a bit of a cushion. Nine points. But if Stump Mitchell can break one here, oh, who knows? This game's a long way from being over. 7.21 left to go. Suchi will kick this one out way to Market Square Arena. Hits the goalpost. Touchback, and the Cardinals start from their own 20-yard line. If you think this has been a good one, strap it on for the Giants and the Redskins at RFK Stadium, or the Eagles and the Cowboys. And again, some dissension down Dallas way. There are some problems, and also in the news down in Dallas that Coach Landry is considering trading Danny White, whether that happens during the course of this 84 season or happens in, during the offseason is yet, yet, has yet to be seen, but he's still considering uh, trading Danny White, and that's something in itself. Why would he trade away Danny White? White's taken him to the playoffs for all those years in a row, just hasn't won the big game. I can't see it. If trading him doesn't help the football team. Right now, the Cardinals need some help, and they need nine points. Green right, Philly left. Complete over two linebackers in the general direction of Pat Tilly, but that's just a long incompletion. The Vikings on top over the Falcons. Atlanta playing catch up, though. That's a final. And next week on Doubleheader Sunday, the Bears will be in Seattle. Oh, my. Joe Walton's got the Jets on track, and Sam Weiss having some problems with his Bengals. The Raiders have come back against Kansas City. The Chiefs led 10-0 in that game. And the Patriots were behind 23-0 in that game. They've come back at Foxborough. Lomax, 12 of 33, 182 yards, but 
three interceptions. Green right. Philly, top of your screen. Second and ten from the 20 of the Cardinals. Lomax, look out. Loses the football with his arm in promotion. Vernon Maxwell came flashing through. That's a, that's a big break. Good job by Maxwell. He's a good blitzer. That good strength, good size. He comes in from the right side of your screen. Lomax gets good time, but the defensive back for the Colts are covering up pretty good. He can't find an open receiver, but by that time, it's too late. Here's Lomax going down. See that ball laying around the church? Bounces right back to Lomax. Is that a fumble or an incomplete pass? I would call that a fumble. I think the officials did it also. 6.48 left to go. Cardinals in trouble. Flood formation, floating pocket by Lomax. We'll go for all of it. Cedric Mack, incomplete. You like the play call when you need 10 yards? I don't like that at all. That's just a desperation effort, and most of the time you're not going to come up with that. How about the pass patterns that the Cardinals are calling? It seems to me to be taking too much time to develop. If the receivers are not getting in their routes fast enough. It, get a good rush, a lot of blitzing. They're getting man-to-man -man coverage downfield. The receivers got to get in their routes a little quicker, and Lomax has got to hit them. Cardinals on the short end by nine. The crowd on their feet here at the Hoosier Dome. Birdsong will punt it away. Larry Anderson is back deep, and the Colts, hey, they're going to come out of this with great field position. Good field position. Time is running down on the clock. A lot of things in the Colts' favor at this point. The nine-point Indianapolis advantage. Birdsong bangs the beauty. It's a high end-over-end -end kick. Anderson at the 45 of the Colts to midfield and gets shot down backwards. Earl Farrell, the first to get down there. So the Colts have a nine-point lead. They've got the football at midfield, and they've got 6.22 on the clock. A 40-yard punt, a five-yard return. The Colts by nine against the Colts. Listen to them in the Hoosier Dome. A nine-point Colt lead over the Cardinals. Mike Fagel, 11 out of 21 passing, 174 yards. Curtis Dickey, 20 carries, 106 yards. That is the sixth 100-yard rushing game for Curtis Dickey. You don't expect Tegel to put it up at all, do you? I think he'll stay on the ground. That's where their success has been, on the ground. He'll probably continue. He passes the ball. Fish will take that sword out and give him an appendectomy. Curtis Dickey sweeps left. McMillan throws the block. Dickey, first down for the Colts. Or the Cardinals can't stop this running attack. And these guys get going. Dickey and, Dickey and McMillan again running over Chris Hinton. And Ben Ut, watch 75 and 64. You'll see the blocking coming you see, at you. You see Ut pulling, hitting, controlling his man, even tight end Dave Young getting a good block. And Dickey turns it up. Well, he gets ahead of steam. Watch this lick. He delivers the blow. He doesn't take anything there. Line of scrimmage, the 38-yard line of the Cardinals. St. Louis must force a turnover. They trail by nine. Five and a half left when the ball is snapped. McMillan dies to about the line of scrimmage. Maybe a short pickup. What goes on in the defensive huddle now? What are the guys saying? Aside from let's try to strip him of the football. Well, first of all, they want to stop him. Second of all, they want to go for the football. They want to tackle the football, get an arm in there, try to make something happen, try to create a turnover. You know, on paper, these Cardinals shouldn't even, uh, the coach shouldn't even be in the game with the Cardinals. But the, the only thing, this game isn't played on paper. Played on paper, it's played on aftertaste. Cardinals came in and said, we know you're going to run the football. We're going to stop it. They have it. Oaks don't shift. They don't put nobody in motion. They just come right at you. Strength against strength. That's Curtis Dickey diving down to about the 37-yard line. When you look up at the scoreboard and you see the Colts 33, the Cardinals 24, and you talk about maybe the Indianapolis Colts posting their second win, I go back to what Nesby Glasgow told us at practice on Friday. He said it's not so much that we win as the other teams lose, but I think you're seeing a maturing young Colts team coming all together here. They played well on specialty teams. 
They've been tenacious on defense with the interceptions, and when they've had to, they've capitalized on those turnovers and taken it in for a score. That's right. They got the turnovers, but they made the turnovers happen, and that's why they're ahead in this ballgame, and that's why they have 33 points. They have great field position created by turnovers. Cardinals would like to shut them down here on third and nine and get the football back and keep them off the board. There's that floating pocket. Tegel wants Butler. Penalty flag is down. Butler in the corner. Out of bounds. Did he catch the ball? He did not. Tegel cannot believe the call. Of course, the sellout crowd here at the Hoosier Dome is for the blue and white. Let's check Jerry Seaman on the penalty. Benny Perrin will bump him out of bounds. Could he have caught the ball inbounds, or was he bumped out of bounds? Looks like it was a good catch to me. It's the kind of catch where you make the catch, but you don't have a chance to put your feet in bounds. He's forced out by the defender. It should have been a good catch. Benny Perrin was that defender, the free safety in his third year out of Alabama. Jerry Seaman will have the last word on the penalty flag. It has nothing to do with whether the catch was legal or illegal. But it may give the Colts another down. So the point is mute. Wouldn't it count it anyway? Bob Daly, who's directing today's game and has been directing, I think, since the days of leather helmets. Illegal formation. No end. On the left end of the line of scrimmage, the penalty be declined. There was no completion as a receiver would not have landed inbound. Not in the opinion, not in the opinion of the sellout crowd. Anyway, Mr. Daly reminds us that former Washington Redskin by the name of Pat Fisher used to be pretty good bumping people out of bounds like that. That's right. He was a great player. Not big in size, only 5'9", about 180 pounds, but he was very tenacious and very intense player. Steve Bird, number 82, is back. Stump Mitchell is not. Bird back at his own 10-yard line. Ron Stark, who has had a great game, averaging about 49 yards a kick, should be able to put this one into the end zone. Of course, what he'd like to do is knock it out of bounds at about the five-yard line. Cardinals with a return on. Stark hangs the high one up. It'll hit at the one and go on into the end zone. Cardinals get a bit of a break. They will start from the 20-yard line, but... They've got 3.48 left to go, and they trail by nine points. The Indianapolis Colts, 33. The St. Louis Cardinals, 24. Lomax and the Cardinals and company come back. With a nine-point Cardinal deficit, keep in mind that a touchdown by St. Louis and a field goal can win it. Still 3.48, but they've got to score quickly. First and 10, St. Louis. Five defensive backs in there for the Colts. Tate Randall, who had the interception, is the fifth back. Lomax unloads. He looks for Tilly. He's got Tilly out of bounds at the 43. First down for St. Louis. That's unbelievable. We can see right there, the Colts are right on schedule what they want to do. They like to rush that ball 40 times and pass it about 20 times. And they're right on schedule. And Lomax has thrown the ball 30 times, but their completion percentage is way down. Well, that's something to do with all the interceptions that the Colts have put up there. Yeah, they think that Colts pretty good. Last play only took seven seconds, however, and they pick up 23 yards. That's Green motioning across from the bottom of your screen to the top side. Philly is outside of him, and Cedric Mack, the former cornerback, lines up wide right. Lomax to Green. If he can break it to the 45, the 40. Looks for a block to the 35. Philly will throw a block to the 30. Roy Green is gone. Touchdown. St. Louis in two plays, 80 yards. What an effort by Roy Green. Just a short pass designed to keep the drive going, pick up some short yards. But when you got a player like Roy Green, he can make things happen. A game breaker. 47 yards. Watch on the cross. Look for the block by Pat Tilly. As Green came back, he knew exactly where Tilly was going to be. Green shakes the tackle there, and then he goes to the right part of your screen, breaks it outside. He's holding that ball loose, but he knows he's got that running room. You see the block by Tilly, the left-hand part of your screen, and Glasgow cannot make the effort. What an effort by Green to get in the end zone. What a day Green is having despite dropping three or four passes. Shula said the best way to silence a home crowd is with a long, sustained scoring drive. How about 80 yards in two plays? Oh, well, Cardinals can score in a hurry. Big extra point by O'Donohue is good. So the Colts, who had a nine-point lead, now have a two-point lead. How do you like a 20-yard scoring drive? Or a 20-second scoring drive? That's something. Next week.
Cardinals will be visiting Bums Boys down in New Orleans. You could read that. The 49ers and the Eagles, the Redskins in New England, the Rams and Cincinnati. Bengals are having a tough time. The Rams in action later this afternoon. They're in Pittsburgh at Three Rivers Stadium. That's a final. They win today. And, of course, they're the second half of our doubleheader game next week. Franco Harris and Walter Payton on the same field the Dome in Seattle. Well, you know, Jimmy the Greek predicted the Chicago Bears at their 3 0. He's right on track. Greek's having a good weekend. He had slew of gold at 4 to 5 in the Woodward yesterday. He's not exactly going out on the limb. But in the off track. 33 31. Colts lead by two. What goes on now? You've got a two point lead. Obviously, if you can continue to pick up, pick up first downs, you can run out the clock. But. You, you can't go into a show. Well, for the Cardinals, the pressure will lie with, lie with their defense. They got to try to get the ball back for their offense as quickly as possible. They hope to get the Colts in a three, three plays and out situation. On the other hand, the Colts like to get their running game going, pick up a couple first downs, eat up as much of this pocket as possible, and put that pressure on the Cardinals. O'Donoghue bangs it away. Bill Smith, who broke one from 96, starts from the four again. This time, however, he dives to the 17 in the grasp of John Good. John Good, the rookie out of Youngstown State. Nico Noga, the headhunter. Let's see if he gets in there. He's down there. He's got good speed. He gets down there, trying to force some action. Good kick by Donahue. Good height on the kick. You see Noga running past blockers, making the ball carrier just as his pass he just tackle Noga right in there on the play. First and ten and a fifth for Nico Noga. They spotted at the 18-yard line for Phil Smith. Cardinals trail by two. Colts will work on the clock. Quarter left. Butler right. Back to Dickey and McMillan. Dickey coming at you. McMillan blocks. Up close to the 20. Picks up two tough yards. Second down and eight. Kurt Allerman, whose father was a teammate at Miami of Ohio with Era Parsegian and his dad played for Woody Hayes. Well, you know the Colts are going to run the ball. It's just a matter of the Cardinals stopping them, giving themselves another chance to try to pull this game out. Second and eight. Line of scrimmage to the 20-yard line. Butler comes near side. Porter to the top of the screen from the eye pro set. Dickey is the tailback. McMillan is the fullback. Fake by Pagel. Wants the tight end. David Young behind him. That would have been a first down and more because the cornerback came up. Leonard Smith trying for the interception. Well, if he would have caught that, he had some running room. David Young kind of took his eye off that ball. He might have seen that running room before he had the ball in his grasp. Surprised to see the Colts go in that situation. Clock stops on the incomplete attack. You see the time remaining and the concern on fifth-year Cardinal coach Jim Hannafin. This is going to be, excuse me, Jim, this is going to be an interesting call here. Third and eight. Do not know before you drop back passing. It could be, we could see a draw in this situation if they want to play it safe. If not, throw a pass to the sideline. If the guy's open, hit it. If not, throw it away. You saw Frank Kush, who took over a Colts team that was long on apathy and short on work habits. Third and eight. Hagel will throw. Looks, fires, got Porter, but he is hammered down by the man they like to call Wahoo, or the devil, Leonard Smith. He's a hitter. He's a hitter. A couple players, E.J. Jr. and Bubba Becker, said they wish they had a bell on Leonard Smith because he's the one that kind of come in there and clean up the pile. Tenacious hitter. The ball is thrown behind Porter, who beat Smith on the play, but here comes Smith finishing it off. Yeah, Baker and Jr. said you got to look out when you're in there in a tackle. If Smith throws his body around, he comes in and hurts his own guy. Well, the Cowboys had a player like that, Cliff Harris, and he was always around the pile, and he beat up more of his own teammates than opponents. Well, that's who Jim Hannafin likened Leonard Smith to. Is it Cliff Harris, Kenny Easley? Steve Bird should give the Cardinals good field position, but Stark hangs a beauty. He packs Bird up to the 23. Might have outkicked the coverage. Bird breaks it across the 40 and goes out of bounds to stop the clock. Two minutes, 11 seconds left to go in this football game, and the Cardinals are only a field goal away from winning. 
Tonight on CBS, you'll see an all-new edition of 60 Minutes. ER, the new show, with Elliot Gould. Emergency Room, with Elliot Gould. And Some Kind of Hero, the movie tonight. But it all starts with CBS and 60 Minutes following football. And don't forget, this is Doubleheader Sunday. So you'll see coming up next, either the Eagles and the Cowboys from Texas Stadium, or the 0-2 Redskins against the 2-0 Giants. Right now, these two teams are thinking about coming out of the Hoosier Dome 2-1. They get in 1-1. and one. Cardinals go with double tight. Doug Marsh and Greg LaFleur. Flat to the right side. Philly inside. Green out. Delay to Otis Anderson. Strange play call. They take it down to the 44-yard line. Second and six. Johnny Cook came up to make the tackle. Now, Johnny Cook, Drew told you about him making the adjustment and the change in position. He's in his third year from Mississippi State. We asked him about his advancement and how he was adjusting. He said, nobody my own age is going to whoop me. Two-minute warning. Cardinals trail the Colts by two. Conferring with Frank Cush and the defensive coordinators, deciding whether to play the nickelback defense now. Anticipating pass on second and five, but they stay with four defensive backs. Eugene Daniel, Nosey Glasgow, James Burrow. Slot to the right side. Green is to the bottom, and the slot is Pat Tilly. The tight end is Mark as well now. Motion to Otis Anderson, a little bit to the left. Pat Tilly will go out of bounds and stop the clock, but not before he picks up a Cardinal first down. Eugene Daniel chases him out of bounds. All they have to do is work down into field goal range, for that man, the man that Jim Hannafin told us last night has such mental toughness. You all know, of course, what a disastrous game he had against the New York Giants on Monday night last year. And after that, his confidence was shaken. In fact, it was a question for Jim Hannafin as to what to do. They brought in a punter from Clemson, or a place kicker, Bob Pauley. But he had no leg, Pauley didn't. In fact, Hannafin said you could hear the no leg when the foot met the football. So he stayed with Neil O'Donohue. Motion across by Doug Mark. Pitch back, Otis Anderson, Marsh with a block, LaFleur with a block, Anderson out of bounds inside the 30. Nesby Glasgow chased him out of bounds. Well within O'Donohue field goal range because this year, Hannafin in the first game was even questioning himself. He said, now wait a minute, if I put O'Donohue in here in our first game against the Packers and he misses a field goal, they're going to run both of us out of town. <laughs> See Otis Anderson there picking up yard. He's got a good block from Roy Green. Talked about him all day catching balls. There he is getting that second effort downfield to spring Otis Anderson for some big yards. Yep. Well, we'll get back to Neil O'Donnell here in just a second. It's first and ten as they approach the 28 yard line. Cardinals, of course, would like it not to come down to a field goal try because so much can happen. They'd like to take it in for the touchdown. Look for Tilly. Here come the Colts. Lomax unloads in the direction of LaFleur. Now the fans here will want a, an intentional grounding, but they won't get it. No, not on that play. It's a good play by Lomax to get rid of that football and not cause a sack because a sack could put them out of field goal range. Still in field goal range right here. Back to O'Donohue. After that bad Monday night game against the Giants, O'Donohue came back in a game against the Vikings and banged a 52-yarder through. But it was this year when Hannafin put him in against Green Bay. So, boy, if he misses this one, they're going to run both of us out of town. But he responded. The pressure on O'Donoghue. He hopes they score with a touchdown. <laughs> Slot to the right. Second and 10 from the 28 of the Colts. They're not risking a turnover as the big bruising tailback, Otis Anderson, barrels down to about the 28-yard line. Let me ask you a question now as they unpile and contemplate third down. This is a very big football game for two programs. Of course, the Cardinals are thinking about a playoff possibility. The Colts are young. They had a big lead, up to nine points. Should the Colts lose this game, what does it do to their confidence? Well, it's got to shake them a bit, but they played a good football game. You know, there's a lot you can learn in losing a football game as well as winning a football game. If the Colts end up losing this game, I'm sure they're going to learn a lot. And when this situation arises again, when they do get a lead, they're going to respond better and try to protect that lead a little better. Third and nine from the 27-yard line of the Colts. Indianapolis shows blitz, and they're coming. Lomax reads it, looks to unload, chased out, fires, and they lose two yards. Otis Anderson. The original line of scrimmage was down at about the 27. He was hammered down at the 29. So it is field goal time. 
for the man that Jim Hannafin likes to say has as much mental toughness as anybody. Now, the clock winding down. If you're the Colts, you want to call timeout and give him time to think about this? Well, Don O'Donoghue's case, that, that wouldn't be a bad idea since he's had his problems in situations like this before. But they're going to let him go as the clock winds down inside 20 seconds. Benny Perrin will hold. Hasmark near side. Randy Clark will snap. It will be a 46-yard field goal try for Neil O'Donoghue. Cardinals have a one-point lead. And look at him go out to O'Donoghue. Seven seconds left. Look at Hannafin. He's right in there with the rest of the team. He's happy. He's stuck with O'Donoghue, and it paid off for him this time. You got to give the Cardinals credit. They were out of this football game, had a lot of turnovers. Lomax had his problems, but the character of this team has shown through, and now they got a 34 to 33 lead. With just seven seconds left for the Colts. The Colts have played so well. Let's see if we can watch O'Donoghue's reaction here. Good concentration, keeps the head down. Keeps the back, gets good height on the ball. No chance to block this. That's made it easily. Watch Jimmy Hannah. Hannah. see the reaction. He's watching, he's watching. What's going through his mind at this time? There he goes, watch the head. Looks like he's in a tennis match. It's good. <laughs> Look at him. Throw that stuff off. Let me get this celebration. Well, you talk about the character of the Cardinals, and certainly that man is at the helm, and he's stuck with Neil O'Donoghue. Where the Cardinals stayed, they kept fighting. They, they're out of it. They kept hanging in there. Two big plays by Roy Green to get them some quick touchdowns, get them back in the game. Each time they look like they're out of it, look at Frank Cook. He can't handle it. Some win, some lose. That's what's so hard to take in the game of professional football. Well, especially as well as the Colts played here this afternoon. I mean, they broke a 96-yarder for a touchdown. They were in Neil Lomax's back pocket. They gave Roy Green all kinds of head up, headaches uh, the first half, and Green came back with an extraordinary performance in the second half. Don't forget, it's doubleheader Sunday, so some of you will see the 2-0 Giants for the 0-2 Redskins. That game is already tied at 7-all, so they're banging heads at RFK. The Eagles and the Cowboys doing at it down Texas way. That'll be coming up as well. And, of course, Brandon Irv with scores and highlights of our doubleheader game as well to bring you up to date on all the action around the NFL today. Vikings, they had a tough game against the Falcons. That, that one is over now. Swift kick. Clock will start when it's touched by a Colt. At the 12, Phil Smith needs to go all the way. We'll stop it now at the 23 with three seconds left. Three seconds left, so the Colts probably have time for a Hail Mary play, and they can hope for a reception and maybe a penalty. Welcome to my world. The executive producer of NFL CBS football for the second consecutive Emmy-winning season is Terry O'Neill. Senior producer, Charles H. Milton III. And today's game, produced by Eddie Gorin. Directed by Bob Daly. And the rest of the people who bring you the sights and sounds of NFL football here on CBS. From the 24, this should be the last play barring a penalty. Flood formation to the left side. Porter, Butler, everybody's out there. Matt Booza, Hagel will throw it about as far as he can. This game is into the record book. An incredible game came back and took a lead. The Colts drove right back down, and they took a lead. Twice they led by nine points, and then, with a two-play drive that took just 20 seconds, the Cardinals pulled it within two points. Finally, that winning field goal by Neil O'Donohue, St. Louis wins 34-33. So for Drew Pearson, I'm Jim Kelly, saying so long from the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis. The final score, the Cardinals 34, the Colts 33. Coming up next, the New York Giants against the Washington Redskins or the Philadelphia Eagles.